Right. Hello and welcome back to Real Seekers. I'm your host, Dale the Real Seeker. And today I'm really, really excited about today's show. Uh, it's an extra special treat. Uh, so I'm, I'm continuing on with my Shroud Wars discussions and debates. And um, this time it's going to be something special. So we're going to be having a, a three pro Shroud experts coming on to discuss their image forming mechanisms and their takes on the Shroud together. Um, so we have a couple of new people um, joining us. So in the first place, we have Dr. Julio Fonte. Welcome to the show, Julio. Hello. Awesome. Th thanks for coming on. And we also have another uh, newbie, someone who I'm also really excited to, and I, I've linked to some of his work on the Shroud before for you guys. Uh, Bob Seifker is here. Hey, Bob. Good morning. Thanks for being here. And someone who, who's been on the show quite a lot and put up with me a few times now, Bob Rucker. Uh, hey, Bob, welcome back. Awesome. All right, cool. So the plan for today today's show, uh, we're going to spend, we're going to let each of the three guests give their take on, first of all, the historical provenance of the Shroud, um, what they think in terms of that, the evidence for and against. And then we're going to let each of the guests kind of question each other afterwards. We can't have a, a totally informal discussion like we normally do just because there are language issues with some of the guests and that sort of thing. So we've tried to set it up a little bit more formally. Um, and then we're going to get into the second part, image formation and the mechanisms involved there. Uh, same deal. Each of the three guests will give their take and then we'll have some Q&A periods with the guests. So with that said, um, I want to get straight into introducing the guests for the audience. So, um, Julio, do, do you want to introduce the audience as to who you are and maybe how you got involved in the Shroud? Um, excuse me. Uh, let me think a, a bit. Uh, it is uh, more than 20 years that I am uh, involved in the Shroud because uh, it is uh, just the Shroud that called me uh, many times uh, in the past. And uh, I decided to study uh, this uh, particular image when I began to uh, teach uh, to my students uh, during uh, in the course of uh, mechanical measurements uh, I began to teach how to process uh, the images via computer and uh, I thought that as the uh, the image, uh, the body image of the shroud is uh, up to now impossible to be reproduced. Perhaps some uh, new technique uh, via computer could have uh, made light on this. And uh, I presented my first paper at the Nice conference in France in 1997. And uh, there I was in contact with many researchers of the Shroud that uh, gave me so much material about uh, this uh, relic that uh, up to now, uh, I cannot stop my, my work. So yeah, it, it's fascinating. There's so much, there's so much there with the shroud evidence and stuff. So awesome. All right, um, cool. Well, I'll turn it over to Bob S as the, the other new guest on today's show. Do, do you wanna just kind of introduce the audience as to who you are and a little bit about how you got involved with the shroud evidence and stuff? Um, sure. Um, I've been involved with the shroud for, for over 20 years. Um, uh, I'm an engineer by training, um, was a vice president of two software companies. And along the way, uh, living in Colorado, I was introduced to John Jackson, uh, the Shuren Shroud Center. And I was affiliated uh, for many years with the Shroud Center of Colorado. And it's, it's there that I got my initial education on the Shroud attended several 
uh, shroud conferences, read everything I could possibly read, including wonderful work by Julio. Uh, know Bob Rucker from several years ago and have read all his papers. Uh, so I, I am a, a shroud uh, fanatic in a way. I, I believe absolutely that the shroud is a miraculous image of Jesus at the time of his resurrection. I am intellectually convinced of that. Uh, <clears throat> Julio is working on some very powerful evidence. Uh, uh, the, the source of the light is where the, I, I would say Bob Rucker and Julio and I all agree that radiation or light is the only source for the shroud image. Uh, the question is, what is that light physically? Where does it come from? What's its characteristics? Uh, but I think we all agree that, that this is not a human artifact at all. There's something miraculously uh, wonderful about the shroud, that light is at the source or radiation is at the source of the image. Awesome. Awesome. All right, cool. So turning to you, Bob, obviously the audience already knows who you are, but do you want to just spend a couple minutes and maybe update us? What have you been up to since you're on the show last time? Well, let's see. Uh, in uh, August of last year, I spoke in Baltimore uh, and made a, a feature a PowerPoint presentation to the American Association for Non-Destructive Testing. And I documented that presentation in my paper number 32 uh, on my website, uh, shroudresearch.net. Uh, and then uh, just last month, I, I spoke at a, a Christian apologetics conference in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, and I've not put that paper onto my website yet. So uh, I have developed, um, you know, I started with just working on the carbon dating problem. Uh, and then uh, I've expanded that into actually, uh, I believe, explaining three different uh, main mysteries of the shroud, the image formation, carbon dating, and why the blood that would have dried on the body is now on the shroud. Awesome. All right, cool. Well, with that said, uh, let's get straight into this. Uh, I want to respect my guest's time and that sort of thing. So the first major aspect, we want to look at the historical provenance of the shroud and, and why my guests think that uh, the evidence shows that the shroud is authentic uh, and that sort of thing. So Julio, since you have your PowerPoint conveniently up and running for us, um, do you want to give your opening presentation about the history of the shroud? Yes, uh, uh, wait a bit uh, that I search for the, this, uh, this map uh, show uh, the historical path of uh, the Holy Shroud. Uh, we see that uh, it was in Jerusalem uh, at about uh, 30, 30, uh, 33 AD, but uh, we don't know for sure where does it come from. Uh, probably uh, it comes from India, and uh, this uh, was uh, uh, evidenced uh, from an historical point of view uh, by some studies, but uh, uh, from a scientific point of view, uh, it results that uh, uh, the dust um, uh, vacuumed from uh, the shroud uh, have uh, the DNA uh, due to many contamination. And uh, some year ago, uh, the Padua University, in the person of uh, Professor Barcaccia, made uh, a DNA analysis of uh, this uh, dust vacuum from the shroud. And uh, he evidenced that uh, about 40% of the DNA comes from uh, the Indian population. Uh, this uh, implies that uh, probably the shroud was uh, waved and uh, prepared in India 
and then was imported in Jerusalem in the first century AD. Uh, we know uh, that uh, it, 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 uh, the shroud was uh, the fabric that covered the, uh, the resurrected uh, Jesus Christ. And then uh, there are some centuries uh, of uh, uh, different uh, hypotheses. I know that the principal hypothesis is uh, this, uh, that uh, uh, it was uh, seen in Edessa, uh, uh, the actual San Liurf in Turkey, about uh, uh, from the second century up to the ninth century. Then uh, I, I uh, can say surely the uh, shroud was seen uh, in the Byzantine Empire at Constantinople. Uh, at least uh, from uh, 1944 uh, uh, up to the 12th century. And this is demonstrated by many uh, Byzantine coins uh, uh, reproducing the face of Jesus Christ equal to that of the shroud. Then uh, we have some uh, uh, dark period and uh, uh, then uh, it reappears uh, in France at uh, Lyrie in uh, 13, uh, 53. Uh, then uh, uh, it was uh, uh, transported to, to Chambéry in 1502. Uh, and there in 1532, there were uh, the famous uh, fire that uh, partially damaged the, the shroud. Then it was taken in uh, Turin uh, up to now, um, um, uh, except some uh, short periods during some wars. Uh, for example, during uh, the last, uh, the second war, a mondial war was uh, in Monte Vergine uh, in, in Italy. Uh, let's uh, uh, focalize uh, the attention here uh, about the provenance of the shroud and uh, uh, let's go uh, to the next slide. Uh, that uh, uh, it is evidence that uh, the uh, results of the uh, DNA analysis, that uh, the analysis of uh, the DNA vacuum from the shroud uh, relative that, uh, to the contamination. And we have that 55% uh, of DNA comes from uh, people uh, typical of uh, the, mid, uh, uh, the area of uh, Jerusalem. Uh, as uh, we have seen before, 38.7% uh, uh, of uh, the um, DNA comes from India and only 5.6% uh, of DNA comes from uh, people coming uh, uh, from European people. So uh, it is uh, very uh, improbable from a scientific point of view that uh, the shroud uh, was produced in Europe, uh, perhaps in, in the Middle Age. Uh, but I am sure that uh, the shroud is the original shroud that uh, wrapped the body of Jesus Christ during his resurrection. Uh, about uh, the Byzantine Empire, uh, we can return here, uh, uh, Constantinople, uh, we have uh, a numismatic evidence that uh, uh, the shroud was seen there. Uh, we can uh, begin with uh, uh, the emperor uh, Justinian II, uh, who uh, in uh, the seventh century 
uh, coined the first uh, uh, coin uh, representing uh, uh, Jesus Christ. Here we see uh, the inscription, inscription Jesus Christ, Kings of Kings. And this face is uh, uh, very similar to that of the shroud. Uh, I have made a comparison uh, here. Uh, here we see other coins uh, of other emperors who uh, reproduce uh, the face of the shroud. And uh, here is uh, a comparison between the face uh, of Christ on the shroud and uh, the face of uh, Christ on the uh, gold solidus of Justinian II. Here is uh, uh, the superimposition of the two images. And here we see many congruence points that are listed here. I have not the time to enter in the details. But uh, uh, a statistical analysis uh, showed that uh, the engraver who coined this, uh, this coin had only seven chan chances of a billion uh, possibilities. So uh, it, this demonstrates that uh, the engraver surely saw uh, the holy shroud uh, to copy this face. Uh, another uh, another uh, evidence uh, comes from the study uh, of the uh, dust vacuum from the shroud. Uh, this is a paper published uh, by me and a colleague of mine uh, some years ago that uh, studying the vacuum the, uh, slides, uh, vacuum dusts, this is uh, a filter containing them, we detected that uh, the dust uh, contain micrometric particles of electrum. Le the electrum is a particular uh, gold and silver alloy just used for the coins uh, during the Byzantine Empire. So uh, we have uh, uh, an, an evidence that uh, these coins uh, let the traces on the shroud. And uh, uh, here is an example of a coin uh, of electrum. This is a percentage of uh, the alloy that is very similar to uh, a dust particle detected on in a fiber coming from the shroud. And this, uh, uh, this cut indicates that probably the uh, Byzantine people uh, rubbed their coin on uh, the um, uh, on the shroud, just to make uh, this, uh, uh, these uh, coins uh, uh, representing the uh, body of Jesus Christ. This is uh, the one resurrected from the shroud. Uh, they rubbed the, uh, their coin just to make uh, up Iga Horred Iger Order relics uh, to conserve. Uh, on in their home. Uh, so we have many indication that uh, the shroud uh, was uh, was shown was, uh, 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 during the Byzantine Empire and uh, then also in other uh, area uh, uh, there. Uh, near Constantinople, let's say. So, uh, turning to the, uh, the path, uh, this is uh, uh, a sure point. Uh, the other sure point is Jerusalem. And uh, uh, perhaps now we have to uh, deepen the study about uh, the real provenance 
from India or uh, other possibilities, let's say. Awesome, awesome. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much for your opening presentation there. Um, if you just want to stop sharing your screen, I want to turn it over to Bob S to make his opening presentation. Um, so Julia, if you, yeah, assuming you, do you, do both of you guys have PowerPoints or do you guys not have visuals? I do not have visual. Okay, Bob R, do you, do you have visuals? Uh, no, no, I don't, not at this point. Okay, cool. So, so Julia can just leave up his PowerPoints then. So Bob S, yeah, I'll, I'll turn it straight to you and, and, make your opening case for the historical provenance of the shroud. Okay. Um, everything that Julio said, I'm in agreement with, except for the explanation of the missing years. Uh, mm -hmm. There is no explanation of the missing years. So they've been imposed on us that the shroud disappeared in 1204 or supposedly disappeared in 1204 and then shows up in Lyry, France. Uh, in 1353. Uh, there is an alternative to the missing years, and that's that the shroud never left Constantinople in 1204. It stayed in the royal collection in the palace in, in Constantinople. There's a, a, an interesting connection between some key players in this. The last uh, Latin emperor of the Byzantine Empire was Baldwin II. Baldwin II, interestingly enough, was the cousin of King Louis the Ninth, St. Louis. And that's, that's interesting because St. Louis ended up with many of the relics from the imperial relic collection in Constantinople. And as the cousin of uh, Baldwin II, that's an interesting connection. Did he end up with the shroud? Uh, the answer to that is, I believe it is true that he did. There's a, uh, an entire book, uh, almost an entire book on this, uh, written by uh, an American. Uh, but <clears throat> the connection between uh, Baldwin II and King Louis II, or King Louis IX, is interesting. Um, and then there's another interesting, one of King Louis' closest allies and friends was John de Jeanville. John de Jeanville was the grandfather of Geoffrey de Charnay. So there's four people linked together that all had interest, deep interest in the shroud. And I think the missing years were not missing, that actually uh, King Louis uh, IX had helped bail out and fund uh, the, the, the emperor in Constantinople, Baldwin II. Baldwin had, had run, into the, run into tremendous financial problems and he had to get loans from Italians actually, God bless the Italians to keep the empire running at the end. And King Louis actually bailed him out, but bailing him out, the shroud was uh, in, stayed in Constantinople, but it had been uh, used as uh, collateral promise for the loans. And there's a very interesting theory that the missing years aren't missing. That doesn't really change much at all in terms of the path of the shroud from uh, Lyrie uh, to uh, Turin uh, and the early, the early route. Um, Odessa, another, an, another alternative to Odessa is Kamuliana. Uh, but all agree, I think all of us would agree that the shroud was in fact in Constantinople and it was in Constantinople clearly in 1204. And between 1204 and 12, 1353, uh, the question is open. But uh, I think the connection between Baldwin, King Louis the Ninth, Pope Innocent the uh, Third, Jean de Jeanville, the grandfather of uh, Geoffrey de Charnay, that linkage is so tight uh, that the theory that the shroud moved through that passage of hands. Remember that um, uh, 
Jeffrey Desjardins said when it asked where the shroud was, was from, he said it was freely given. Actually, his son said that it was freely given. It was not, it was not in any way tied up with the sin of simony. Uh, it was freely given. And uh, uh, so there is a difference in that with Julio. Otherwise, Julio's presented a beautiful historical route. All right, awesome. And uh, turning to our last guest, Bob Bob R. Um, you want to give your opening presentation on, on what you make about the historical provenance and evidence for the shroud? Okay, I, I think uh, both presentations are very interesting. Uh, I'm not a particularly uh, well informed, ac actually, on the details of the history. It, it can get it can get very detailed sometimes, uh, and so I've tried to focus on on the science of it uh, and. Uh, there's there's sufficient uncertainties, I think, in some of the historical uh, route here. I think it's generally right as to what they've said, but but it's hard to prove it uh, that the shroud is the authentic burial cloth of Jesus uh, just from the history, because uh, the shroud of Turin, of course, was called that once it came into Turin. Uh, and so then you have to make connections with the various names by, by which it's gone over the years. And, and there is sometimes some doubt about that. So I, I think the better evidence that the shroud is the authentic burial cloth of Jesus actually goes back to science uh, rather than history, though I have no doubt uh, about the, the routes that have been talked about by Julio and, and Bob. All right, awesome. Uh, so, so yeah, at this point, I want to open it just up. To, just a comment, uh, Dale. Sure. Uh, I agree with uh, Bob on that. I think the history is, is a, people are very interested in that. I'm very interested in it. I think if we get a, the missing years are a problem because they, they correspond to the carbon dating date. And if we can close the missing years, if there's an alternative to the missing years, then that closes to carbon dating, not, not scientifically, but historically. <clears throat> because if we know the shroud uh, route was, was different than, than we just talked about with the missing years, it does add some credibility. But I agree with Bob that the science is, is number one, history is number two, and it is very complicated. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's right. I mean, um, in terms of those missing, there's been at least three hypotheses that people have proposed that I'm aware of. Maybe there's more and that sort of thing. But all right, cool. Um, so what I want to do at this point, I want to open it up to Q and A. I want the the experts themselves to uh, kind of ask each other questions and that sort of thing. Um, so just before we get into that, I, I just have a couple of questions uh, for for you, Julio. Um, mm -hmm. So this is kind of, you've developed scientific tests that date the shroud much earlier than the medieval period, back to the first century. So for example, um, you once touted like FTIR, um, FTIS or FTIR spectroscopy or Raymond spectroscopy and the tensile strength as dating methods. Um, I know a lot of skeptics would say, yeah, but these dating methods haven't been established. So do you want to maybe talk about those uh, dating methods that you've advanced and what is it about? And yeah, what do you make of that? Yes, uh, let me start uh, from uh, the uh, radiocarbon dating uh, in, made in 1988. Uh, the, uh, that uh, is uh, summarized in uh, this uh, slide. Uh, as you know, uh, a piece of cloth was cut in this area, uh, enlarged here, and uh, three pieces were given to uh, three laboratories, uh, Oxford, Zurich, uh, and uh, Taxon in Arizona. And uh, uh, they uh, cut uh, the pieces. This is Oxford, for example. Uh, Oxford subdivided the sample in three parts. 
and uh, uh, burned uh, them, uh, counting uh, the percentage of uh, uh, relative to the two isotopes of the carbon, in particular carbon 14 and carbon 12. Uh, the same was made by uh, the other uh, laboratories and uh, uh, they detected uh, uh, these uh, uh, ages that we see in red here in this scheme. They, uh, may, they performed a complicated uh, statistical analysis, complicated but wrong, wrong uh, because uh, they uh, did not uh, count for some systematic effect bias uh, probably due to uh, environmental effects. Uh, this is uh, the results uh, obtained with uh, a very small uncertainty that uh, is not in agreement uh, for the results uh, shown here. If we make uh, the difference between uh, this date and uh, this date, uh, we have more than 200 years uh, not in agreement with uh, this uncertainty. But uh, uh, what is important uh, is uh, uh, that uh, he, here is evidence that a trend, a trend not, typ not typical from uh, common uh, statistic analysis that should have been uh, detected apart. And uh, this uh, uh, trend was uh, probably due to an effect an effort that uh, I have not uh, yet demonstrated, but uh, probably was due to the image formation. The uh, energy uh, coming from the inner of the body that uh, uh, produced uh, the body image um, very probably uh, interfered with uh, the atoms of uh, uh, the shroud changing the uh, ratio between carbon-14 and carbon-12. Uh, this uh, was recently proved by a study that I published uh, last year, uh, entitled, Could an anomaly in the Turing Shroud Blood reopen the 1988 radiocarbon result? Uh, in fact, uh, one of uh, the hypotheses uh, uh, supported by Bob Racker is uh, that uh, the, there was a uh, uh, big uh, burst of energy that produced the, the body image, but also interfered with uh, the atoms contained in the uh, cloth, in the linen cloth. In particular, we know that uh, the linen cloth contains uh, um, nitrogen. The nitrogen, uh, uh, if uh, subjected to a neutron radiation, could, uh, can uh, produce uh, additional uh, carbon-14 that uh, can alter the uh, percentage of the, uh, uh, the ratio of uh, carbon-14, carbon-12. And this can be the explanation why uh, it was obtained such a wrong date. The demonstration uh, comes not from linen that has a, a contain a, a percentage of nitrogen not, not simple to detect, but uh, from the blood coming from the shroud. In fact, uh, common blood uh, has uh, the spectroscopic analysis of uh, the blood produce uh, evidences of the presence of nitrogen. In, instead, uh, in the analysis of uh, the blood coming from the shroud, we see the, the absence of this peak. The absence of this peak uh, can be uh, related to the uh, fact that uh, the nitrogen of the blood of the shroud uh, subjected to the uh, burst of energy 
uh, was transformed in carbon-14, thus uh, altering the results. Uh, in addition, I have performed uh, here in Italy uh, with the help of our other colleagues of other universities, uh, three alternative uh, datings. A Raman analysis, a FTIR analysis, and a multi-parametric mechanical uh, analysis that uh, dated the shroud to the first century, uh, the first century after ID. With uh, an uncertainty of more than 200, uh, 200 years, but uh, other analysis have uh, restricted uh, this interval. The uh, multi-parametric mechanical analysis uh, was uh, performed by a new machine that uh, we used, uh, we uh, designed and uh, used at zero cost at U Padua University that consisted in uh, uh, mounting the single fibers of linen that are uh, thinner than a hair, a human hair, and uh, were mounted in a uh, support uh, that was put in this machine and uh, uh, it was mechanically uh, analyzed up to the break, uh, breaking uh, strand, uh, and that was uh, detected also the breaking strand of the fiber. Uh, the other two uh, methods uh, based on uh, uh, IR laser analysis and uh, uh, Raman analysis that uh, are, uh, we see here. This is uh, the uh, Raman uh, machine would, uh, that performed the Raman analysis, and this is the uh, machine relative to IR for, um, Fourier transform analysis. E, to sim simplify uh, uh, things, uh, we can say that uh, a piece of fabric was put uh, uh, in, this, uh, in these machines, and uh, two spectra uh, relative uh, to the Raman and IR analysis uh, came out, and uh, the peaks of these spectra uh, compared with uh, other uh, uh, comparison samples performed uh, per, uh, allowed to uh, detect uh, the uh, year, uh, the, the age of uh, the shroud. Uh, to do th this, uh, we have uh, to uh, um, put, uh, uh, to build a new, uh, new method, three new methods, and uh, uh, the following procedure was necessary to find some tens of ancient samples starting from Egyptian mummy uh, to determine their chemical and mechanical parameter, to determine the corresponding calibration course, to measure the parameters of the shroud, and to determine the corresponding date. Uh, some fibers from the shroud were uh, taken from the filters that uh, uh, have uh, um, collected the fibers uh, vacuumed from the shroud. And uh, uh, they were, uh, the, these fibers were uh, recognized by using a petroscopic microscope uh, who uh, show this particular uh, uh, coral serpent uh, color uh, that uh, it is very typical of uh, the shroud. Then uh, these fibers were mounted in this support, put in this uh, system, in this uh, analytical ba uh, balance, moved by uh, some levers uh, uh, 
in a, a proper uh, uh, system, let's say so. Uh, this uh, is uh, the uh, fiber mounted in this support, uh, put in this uh, machine. This is the fibers uh, glued uh, between this part and this part. This uh, uh, strip uh, uh, was uh, uh, designed in this way in order to be uh, so stiff uh, to be uh, moved uh, uh, during the mounting. And then it was burned in these uh, two bridges in order to have the con connection between the other pa upper part and the lower part only through the, this fiber uh, uh, shown here. This is another uh, configuration of the, uh, the system. And this uh, was an example of the ca calibration curves uh, detected. Uh, here are the points relative, uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, to the mechanical loss factor. Uh, detected uh, by means of uh, known samples, uh, comparison samples, and this is uh, the uh, results of the Turing shroud that uh, reports uh, these results. This is the summary of the result, and uh, these are the mechanical parameters. Uh, not all were uh, good, for example, this was quite doubtful, but uh, the, this is uh, the synthetic results that evidenced the uh, possible uh, age of uh, the shroud detected uh, through FTIR uh, analysis, FT, uh, Raman analysis and mechanical parameter analysis. It is interesting that only the first century is compatible between uh, among the, the three methods. And the, the numismatic analysis confirms that uh, this result. Instead, it is uh, not compatible, uh, obviously, with uh, the uh, 1988 uh, 14, uh, C 14 result. Uh, uh, our results is, uh, uh, is uh, 33 uh, before Christ plus minus 250 years at 90, uh, 95 confidence uh, level. Uh, I have to add that uh, uh, very recently uh, a new study has been published entitled X-ray dating of a, of a Turing shroud linen sample, uh, published by the scientific, scientific uh, journal Heritage. And uh, uh, in synthesis, uh, the X-ray dating produced uh, this uh, plot uh, relative to a piece of the shroud a uh, single thread of the shroud, a few millimeter long, that uh, showed that its degree of uh, um, the uh, depolymerization, degree of the cellulose, uh, dates uh, the holy shroud uh, to the first century AD. This is a new confirmation of our previous studies. So uh, we can uh, be quite sure that uh, from a scientific point of view, uh, the shroud is of the first century AD, because we have at least four scientific methods that confirms this result. Awesome. Yeah. So, and just to clarify for, for the audience, as you can see what we have on the screen, this X-ray dating, uh, this was just published and it dated the Shroud of the First Century. Um, and it was published in a secular peer-reviewed uh, science journal there. Um, so, yes. so that's what Giulio Fonti is, is saying. So there's a total of four scientific tests that together collectively demonstrate the Shroud dates to the first century is what, what his case was. Um, awesome. So say so I want to turn it to you, uh, Bob S. And maybe um, 
turn it to you to either ask questions or raise a comment about your take on on some of this stuff. Um, yeah, it's over to you. Uh, I'll let you do what you wish. Well, my response is I've been following this for years. The, the, uh, the dating of the shroud uh, is, is important to a lot of people. A lot of skeptics use it as just a, uh, a, a single issue that it you know, carbon dated to the uh, 1200s and that's the end of the story. I think what Julio has done is uh, pursue this with scientific rigor for years. Uh, his latest work is a reflect on, reflection on that. I think his work is absolutely phenomenal in terms of what it reveals. And I, it, it's gonna take a while for that to sink in and to get that onto social media and that kind of thing. But uh, the foundation that Julio has built here is absolutely, uh, in my opinion, rock solid. Uh, and it, it's just a, it's a game changer. But it's, but it's tough culturally to make that game changer apparent to the average person who says, oh, the shroud was carbon dated to the 1200, you know. Uh, but Julio has done remarkable work in this research. The Thank you. paper uh, is a testament to that work. Yeah, congratulations on that front. I mean, that's a major, a major accomplishment. So awesome. All right, cool. So, so that kind of answers one thing I wanted to ask you, Bob, asked was uh, about that, that skepticism that these new scientific methods, they're too new, they haven't been demonstrated to be reliable. And, and you're saying, no, that's not, that's not the case, actually, um, type deal. So, all right, cool. I uh, wanted to get your take on that. Uh, one thing, I, last question to ask you, Bob S. Um, I'm interested on your take. What about the Sudarium of Oviedo? Do you think there's some good uh, data linking that to the Shroud of Turin? I'd, I'd be interested on your take on, on the Sudarium there. Uh, it would it would be interesting to uh, to test that I suppose, but it's not it it's a diversion uh, in in a way. Um, it's an important relic. Uh, the face cloth we know there was a face cloth, but I would stay with the shroud. Uh, I don't I don't think I would equate the two, and the carbon dating I don't think is as important. Uh, it would just be another diversion that would take many years to sort out. Uh, I think the work that Julio has done here is where we ought to be focusing. Awesome. All right, cool. Uh, so Bob Barr, yeah, I want, I want to turn it to you about what's your take on some of this? Do you have any questions that you want to ask or comments? Uh, yeah, over to you. Uh, yes, I, I also want to com commend Julio uh, for this work. I think that that's the, the main thing that we say here. Uh, it is he needs to be commended for this. Uh, the three tests that he came up with, and now the, the new uh, test from uh, X-ray analysis, uh, are scientific tests, uh, and they're all confirmatory uh, of the first century date. Um, in some of my papers, I like to put together all of the different date indicators. And uh, I come up with, uh, let's, let's say, 14 different date indicators. One of the best ones that I like uh, is simply uh, the stitch that's used to uh, bind the uh, 3.2 inch side piece to the main shroud. And that's evidently it's a professionally made based upon testimony of, of uh, fabric experts that that's a professionally made stitch, uh, and it's unique, but it's most similar to a stitch that was found in Masada that was destroyed in 73 to 74 AD. So that that stitch uh, appears to date the shroud to the first century. Uh, and so that uh, of these 14 or 15 date indicators, uh, there, there's only one that, that says that uh, was dated between 1260 and 1390, and that's the carbon dating. All the others contradict that. So do you, do you go with just the one and ignore the other 14, or do you kind of go with the 14 and ignore the one? Well, I, I think the better evidence is that the car, there is something wrong with the carbon dating. So uh, usually what people do on the carbon dating is that 
the the carbon the, the raw value from the average of the three laboratories was 1260 plus or minus 31. When that value then is used to correct it for the changing carbon 14 concentration in the air, then a range of 1260 to 1390, 95% uh, probability uh, is, is arrived at. But, but the thing is, that's only considering one aspect of, the car of carbon dating as it relates to the shroud. There's actually four aspects that have to be explained. And that's just one. You cannot come up with an adequate explanation for the carbon dating by just looking at one of the evidences. You have to look at all four. And to me, the carbon dating of the shroud is one of the strongest arguments that the shroud is authentic, that it really is the burial cloth of Jesus. Uh, now, of, let me just name the four different aspects related to carbon dating of the shroud. You do have the date that was obtained, the, the raw value being 1260 plus or minus 31. But you re realize that in carbon dating, what they're measuring is the carbon 14 to carbon 12 ratio. That's what they're actually measuring, yet they're reporting a date. So how do you go from the carbon 14 ratio uh, to the date? Well, you, you use equations to do that uh, with, with the decay of carbon 14 uh, in the cloth based upon the carbon 14 decaying with a 5,730 year half-life. Uh, but, but, the, but the problem here is that when you calculate the date from the carbon 14 to carbon 12 ratio, the equations assume something. And that assumption must be correct to calculate the correct date. And what is assumed is that the carbon 14 to carbon 12 ratio is only changing due to the decay of carbon 14. Now, if that assumption is not right, there's no basis for saying that you know the date at all. Um, and, and so I think that that's part of the issue. So, so that uh, I, I think that there were new carbon-14 atoms created on the shroud by uh, the trace amounts of nitrogen-14 on the shroud absorbing neutrons, uh, and thus each carbon-14 atom, when it absorbs a neutron, kicks out a proton and changes to a carbon-14 atom. Now, of course, the carb new carbon-14 atom, that's what's measured uh, in carbon dating, the carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio. Now, it, it, it's also true that the, the, the amount of carbon-14 in the fibers, uh, in order to change the carbon date from, let's say, 33 AD, up to the midpoint of 1260 to 1390, the amount of carbon-14 on those fibers only has to change by 16.9%. So in other words, if, if there is an event in which neutrons were absorbed in the trace amount of nitrogen-14 on the shroud, uh, and it increased the carbon-14 concentration by 16.9%, uh, yes, you would measure a carbon date of 1260 to 1390, but it wouldn't be the true date. That's the point. Now that's just one aspect, the date. You also have to explain the other three items. You have to explain the slope of, of the experimental values. And that came up with about 36 years per centimeter uh, across the, the relatively small length of the uh, different samples that were sent to the three different laboratories. So you not only have to explain the date, but also the slope of the date, slope or gradient. Uh, and then you have to be able to explain uh, the distribution of the subsample values. Now, uh, sometimes it, 12 values are referred to, sometimes 16 values are referred to because evidently uh, the laboratory in Tucson then averaged pairs of values by day. Uh, and so that, as I understand it, there was actually originally 16 subsamples that were dated. And so you, you, the explanation for the carbon dating of the shroud has to be consistent with the date, the slope, and the range or distribution of those 16 values. Now on Julio's slide number three, 
it, I, I think that was ve a very nice slide to show. Uh, and the thing that it shows is that the uh, distribution of the dates uh, in, uh, increases in date along the x-axis and also along the y-axis. Now, the direction that the samples were laying relative to the y-axis, you can flip the y-axis over. And if you do that, then the distributions that are slow, shown on Julio's slide three agree very nicely with my nuclear analysis computer calculations of the slope of the dates. So, so that uh, the date in the x direction um, uh, is, is because you're going further and further from the bottom of the cloth and toward the center of the body. Uh, and that's where the neutrons are, are being emitted. They're being emitted throughout the entire body. That, that was, I think there's a good basis for that, reasonable basis for assuming that the neutrons were emitted uniformly throughout the body. And in my calculations, when I make that assumption, then the code, the computer code, MCNP, uh, which is a standard code for calculating neutron distributions, uh, it calculated the neutron distributions uh, in the tomb. And the distribution of the neutrons in the tomb is what's kept producing the, the slope, both in the x and the y direction, uh, of the values that Julio showed in slide number three. So I, you know, I, I think we're coming to a point where there, there's, there's kind of a, a coming together of, of this evidence and a, and a consensus uh, of what the solutions are. So that you actually have four items that need to be explained. The date, the slope, the distribution of the 16 subsample values, but also the date of the Sudarium of Oviedo. And I would like to have uh, Julio's three techniques and this new X-ray technique applied to the Sudarium of Oviedo. I think you would obtain basically similar results to the Shroud of Turin. Uh, that is, you would contradict the carbon date. So the Sudarium was carbon dated to about 670 AD. And so the question is, why didn't it date to either 33 or date AD, or why didn't it date to 1260 to 1390 uh, like the Shroud? And, and the answer uh, in my thinking uh, is that it was at a slightly different location in the tomb. Well, that's clear from scripture. It was separate from the body cloth. Now, if you think about uh, the man doing the burial, I think of him as Apostle John at, at the front of the pit or stand-up area in the tomb. Uh, they bring the body in, lay him down on the back side of the cloth. Uh, the person doing the burial would then reach over, take off the face cloth, and then roll it or fold it up. It could be translated either way. Uh, and then just absent-mindedly drop in it on the right side of the bench or, or uh, shelf uh, on, uh, in the tomb. Uh, and he would do that just about the, the thickness of his body, uh, drop it on, on the side bench back from uh, the body cloth. And so uh, when I realized that the shroud, that the Sudarium of Oviedo had a carbon date, I then went to my computer calculations that I'd already made and, and looked at the date at that most likely location for where it would be dropped by the person doing the burial. What I found was that a piece of linen cloth at that location, oh, about maybe a foot and a half uh, back be, uh, toward the entrance and away from the body cloth, but on the side bench. The date that I found in my calculations that I'd previously done was 670 AD in exact agreement with the, with the uh, experimental values. So I, I think I'm on a, a, a good uh, firm basis here uh, to say that the uh, neutron absorption hypothesis is the only hypothesis that's consistent with all four aspects that we know to be true about the carbon dating of the Shroud of Turin. So that's my perspective on this. And I, I've written probably uh, 12 papers on the carbon dating of the Shroud that's on my website, shroudresearch.net. Uh, and I have a, a new one coming out that documents my presentation 
at a Christian apologetics in Charlotte, North Carolina, just last month. Uh, and, and so that's my perspective on it. Awesome. And but if you don't mind me just following up with you there, Bob R., um, just as I asked Bob S., what's your take on uh, Julio's new, like the X-ray dating and that sort of thing? Uh, just for the Shroud skeptics in the audience, what are, what are some of the major criticisms that might be or have been leveled at it? And, you know, how do you respond to those, if you don't mind me bringing that up? I, I've not dealt with, uh, uh, you know, responding to objections to it. I, I think there's a, there, certainly there's uncertainties to this. And, and uh, you know, Julio admits that, that the uncertainties largely arise uh, because of the standards that have to be used to calibrate it. That's always a question of calibration on any type of uh, radiometric dating, carbon dating or any of the other options. It's always calibration is the issue. Uh, and, and so uh, as new standards are found and brought into the overall calibration, the uncertainties will come down uh, on these. That's what I would expect to happen. So uh, yeah, th this, this is a you know, a first of its kind and, and uh, it needs to be greatly commanded, commended, I think, uh, for Julio and his teams doing this and for the new X-ray dating. But all this is confirmatory. Uh, you know, even if we didn't have these uh, Julio's three and the, now the, the new one, uh, we, we would still have about 10 other <laughs> date indicators. Uh, and the fact that the neutron absorption hypothesis is the only option that's consistent with all four aspects of the carbon dating that we know to be true uh, about the carbon dating of the shroud. Awesome. Uh, Ju Julia, so I, I haven't written this down, but I, uh, I just want to ask, ask you, would you agree with that? Like, what, what would you say are the biggest objections that you've heard or seen about the X-ray dating and how do you respond to that? Um, and if you don't understand that, no problem. I haven't written it, but. Uh, if you repeat the, the question uh, more slowly, perhaps I understand better. Uh, uh, what what are the biggest objections to the X-ray dating, and respond? Mm, I think uh, the, uh, it is uh, silence. Uh, many persons against uh, these uh, results are silent now. Uh, in reference to the. Um, other three uh, radiocarbon, uh, uh, other three um, datings. Uh, I have not uh, not uh, had uh, uh, critics about uh, the methods, but uh, in general uh, they said that uh, I have to. Uh, better demonstrate uh, the method because it is new and so on. So uh, I agree uh, uh, and the uncertainty I have assigned uh, is uh, compatible with uh, this, uh, this comment because uh, all uh, these new methods must be better calibrated to obtain uh, lower uncertainty. And uh, another as aspect uh, uh, should be that of uh, uh, detecting if uh, detect better detecting if uh, other uh, environmental parameters co could have affected uh, this result. But uh, it is uh, very particular the result that. Uh, four methods uh, and the additional uh, numismatic analysis confirm the first century uh, of AD, uh, the age in which uh, Jesus Christ was wrapped uh, in this shroud. Awesome. All right, perfect. Thank you so much, guys. All right, cool. So I think with that said, um, if everyone's agreed, uh, unless someone has questions, we can move on to the the main topic of uh, the image formation. Um, before I get to that, does anyone have any questions for any of the panel members or before we move on? No? Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, Bob Rucker. Uh, Dale, you know, I, I was just thinking here, one of uh, people who just assume that 
the one value, you know, the, the one aspect, the one data point of the date totally determines what the date is. Uh, that's just not consistent with the statistical analysis uh, of the actual measurement data, which was finally released uh, under a legal action by the British Museum, so that we now have uh, the statistical analysis in, in that's been uh, documented in uh, four different peer-reviewed journals th that the measurement data that produced the 1260 to 1390 date was heterogeneous. Now, you know, the, the layman doesn't know what that means, but what it basically means is that the carbon dates that were obtained were not consistent with the uncertainties. And what that means is that there must have been, or highly likely, that there was some type of a systematic measurement error or bias in the carbon date result. Not that the measurements were wrong, but the assumption that goes into calculating the dates from the carbon-14 to uh, carbon-12 measurements made the assumption that uh, the, the ratio was only changing due to decay of carbon-14, but a systematic error or bias comes in when that assumption is not true. Uh, and so uh, that's what I'm saying happened here, that there were new carbon-14 atoms created on the shroud, and that produces a systematic error consistent with Julio's uh, figure three and, and the slopes, the different dates that, that were located there. Uh, so that uh, apart from any other dating uh, information on any other method, we know that the carbon uh, 14 date of 1260 to 1390 should be rejected just based on the statistical analysis that's finally been done. And I've done an analysis uh, in my paper 11 uh, on that same issue and come to the same results, consistent with all the previous people who've done statistical analysis uh, on the data. So that there really should be no question about it, that the 1260 to 1390 date should be rejected. That is given no credibility at all. Awesome, awesome. Bob, uh, Dale, just a comment. Bob is absolutely right. The, the, the question is uh, a question though for the public. Uh, the average person uh, can't, what we need is a book, uh, a, a single source book that goes through all this, not a book about the shroud, but a book only about the errors in the carbon dating. Mm. Uh, because if you drag the, the, the typical citizen, if you go to the typical person that might have an interest, is the shroud real? Which... Uh, if you come to the conclusion that it is, it's a life-changing conclusion, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. But the person that asks that question, if you drag them into the details of all of this and say, well, your, your belief in the shroud has to also be capable of understanding all of these arguments on carbon dating and this and that, uh, they just throw their hands up and they say, well, let me go to Wikipedia and see what they say. And then, of course, Wikipedia goes thumbs down. So we need, we need a book that doesn't focus on the shroud itself, but focuses on the inadequacy of the carbon dating and say, we've got to throw that out. And, and don't mention anything else about the shroud, just focus on the dating and say it's irrelevant. And that, that's a backup to the, because the problem we're dealing with, that you're dealing with, and we're all dealing with is how do we get the average person to, to engage the Shroud of Turin. Yeah. So Bob is right. We need, we need a, a thorough discussion in a book that's focused on this of all those points Bob just ran down and Julio. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I, I think um, this kind of relates to uh, Bob, Bob S. was asking me behind the scenes. He wanted to ask, ask me a question um, kind of thing about what's the biggest problem? Is it, do we need to work on more scientific research? Is is it more cultural that's the issue or is it how we're presenting the information? And I kind of answered you, Bob S, an email. I, I think it's profoundly cultural, at least on the popular level. Like this has my, been my experience with atheists and skeptics um, who've never heard of the Shroud. Um, so, you know, I, I remember 
I went on T Jump's show. He's he's got he's a famous atheist YouTuber, and I mentioned the shroud, and he did just what you just said. He went on Wikipedia, and that was case closed. And I I said, well, I can give you some sources on both sides, and you, will you look at least a little bit deeper and stuff? And he's like, no, nope, Wikipedia settles it. So it's it's yeah, I, I find that there's kind of this intellectual fear when it comes to like discussing miracles or anything of a religious nature there's there's this lack of intellectual curiosity and willingness to take a stand and look at the evidence and hey if i judge that the evidence is good here i i'm going to follow the evidence where it is there's always this fear that well, what about 200 years from now if we find out something else and that falsifies me i don't want to look like a fool or something like that so i totally agree with what you're saying like we, we need to have the courage to address head on the the issues and follow the evidence where it leads and maybe yeah. that, that takes the form of let's take this carbon 14 issue just that issue let's study that just that issue we need we need the refutation of that issue out there uh wikipedia and the cultural uh problem is that they just bring up carbon dating say 1200 you know yeah. And but we but we we can't drag them into everything at time. We need a scientific analysis like uh, Bob just talked about that the four points that just destroys the carbon dating says nothing else about the shroud. Just says the argument that it was dated to 1200 is a false argument. It wasn't dated to 1200. Now, if that's why you reject it, that's but it, but that's what the public is rejected on. They say it's always very interesting, but it was carbon dated to 1200. It can't be real. Yeah. Awesome. All right, cool. Um, well, with that said, I, I think we're all pretty much on the same side uh, with this stuff. So, all right, let's move on to, okay, how the heck were these images formed? Granted, it's some kind of miracle. All four of us would agree with that, um, but let's get more specific. So, so Julia, you, you have your PowerPoint already up and running. Do, do you want to explain how you think the images were formed and give your presentation? And so uh, the question is how the image was, pro, uh, was formed. Uh, to this question, uh, I have to uh, answer that we don't know uh, how uh, this image was formed. Uh, and uh, many scientists have, uh, have uh, formulated their, their hypothesis and uh, have made uh, their tests, but uh, no one was able uh, to uh, reproduce uh, this image. And uh, uh, this uh, was a problem um, faced by the Shroud Science Group uh, in some years ago, who uh, agreed to publish uh, a, a paper uh, signed by many researchers uh, entitled Evidenced for Testing Hypothesis about the Body Image Formation of the Turing Shroud. And this uh, was presented at uh, the Dallas Conference on the Turing Shroud in uh, 2005. Uh, this uh, paper uh, that is available in internet uh, shows the many, many uh, characteristics of the body image that, uh, of the shroud that are impossible up to now to be reproduced altogether. Uh, for example, we now I have not the time to present all these features, but just to have an idea, the two body images, frontal and dorsal images, were formed by chemical reaction called oxidation, dehydration, and conjugation of the flex fibers, and there is the absence of pigments. Uh, the, uh, so uh, the image was not painted. And I, I have detected, I have studied the single image fiber, and I uh, confirm that there is no uh, trace of pigment. Uh, another uh, 
uh, the fact uh, is uh, uh, that the image is very superficial and uh, this uh, very beautiful uh, photo made uh, by Barry Schwartz uh, uh, in uh, putting the uh, light behind uh, the shroud show that uh, the body image uh, disappears while the blood image and the other trace remains. So the body image is very uh, superficial at uh, thread level, but also it is uh, very superficial at uh, fiber level, linen fiber level. This is an image fiber that uh, was mechanically uh, ruined in this uh, uh, part. And we see that the, the color is uh, only in the PCU layer that is about 0.2 micrometer thick on a fiber that is about 20 micrometer in diameter. This very superficiality is also typical of some fibers. This is a macro photo taken from the point of the nose. Uh, it is typical uh, to some fibers, but other fibers uh, are not colored, placed side by side with the colored fiber. So I have built a macro model of this uh, thread of the shroud just to uh, explain better this uh, result. And uh, uh, we see that this, uh, uh, this thread can be uh, represented by uh, uh, a bundle of uh, uh, drinking stro uh, straws uh, that uh, are placed only uh, are the red fiber, the colored fiber, placed only on one side, while the center and the, uh, the opposite side is not colored. But uh, 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 we see that uh, uh, some colored fibers are uh, put uh, uh, near uh, uncolored fibers, but uh, uh, as we have seen in the previous image, uh, the, the cellulose of the colored fiber are uncolored. The color all, only resides in a very thin layer uh, outside the fibers itself. There are other image, other features very uh, peculiar, like the uh, negative uh, aspect. Negative aspect that it is not uh, uh, evidenced at different uh, wavelengths. In fact, in the visible light, uh, the image is negative. Uh, in the near infrared. Uh, about in the region of one micrometer, the body image completely disappears and it reappears in positive image in the uh, region of the infrared uh, between eight and 14 micrometers. And uh, the, uh, there is another uh, important fact that uh, the, uh, and I, I can say this because this uh, this uh, work was published in a scientific journal the image uh, is uh, superficial on one side of the shroud in the middle there is nothing and on the back uh, side there is a second image and this uh, put uh, this fact put uh, um, big problems in the uh, explanation of why the body image was was formed. Because uh, if we think to a simple light, if the light uh, impresses uh, the image on one side, it passes through uh, the cloth and uh, uh, it can produce a double image uh, on the uh, double, double superficial image, but uh, it colors also the inner of the fabric. 
So a big problem was uh, that to find uh, if there is a, a source of energy that uh, is able to uh, color uh, the uh, two uh, surfa uh, surfaces, front and back side, without coloring the, same, uh, the, the middle of the, uh, the fabric. And uh, uh, it was uh, uh, the uh, German physic uh, uh, Oswald Scheuermann who detected uh, that uh, the corona discharge uh, act just in this way. And uh, uh, a simple test can be done uh, by using a uh, plasma ball uh, that produces the corona discharge. Uh, in fact, uh, just the corona discharge could be the, one of the first agents that uh, pro uh, produced the, the, this very particular image of the shroud. Uh, corona discharge is a physical uh, effect uh, linked to uh, high, uh, very high uh, uh, electric fields. Electric fields of, uh, that can, for example, be produced in the plasma ball. In this experiment, uh, I have put uh, a linen cloth outside the glass sphere, and behind this uh, cloth, I put uh, my hand. Uh, and here we see this luminescence produced uh, outside the sphere. Uh, linked to the corona discharge. I made uh, some experiment uh, and obtained just uh, the double superficiality of uh, the image. In... Uh, let's go uh, on. Uh, one uh, can uh, ask uh, why and how uh, 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 intense uh, corona, uh, an intense electric field could have produced in the sepulcher uh, 2000 years ago. And uh, an answer, an interesting answer, I have found in studying the so called holy fire that uh, every year, uh, just tomorrow, uh, is uh, the holy site of the. Of the uh, uh, Orthodox uh, uh, Easter, and uh, uh, every holy site of the, of the Holy Easter in, uh, in the uh, edicule of the Saint Sepulchre, it forms uh, a particular uh, phenomenon called holy fire that is linked to uh, electrical fields. This was demonstrated by uh, uh, and, uh, uh, a Russian scientist, Andrei Volkov, uh, who uh, detected, uh, who made measurements in the sepulcher and uh, affirmed that the air is electri electrically charged before the light appears. There is an electric discharge the holy fire is accompanied by the appearance of plasma. A very particular plasma, I have tested it. I went in uh, 2019 in uh, the Holy Sepulchre and uh, I lighted my bundle of uh, candles uh, with the holy fire and put under uh, my beard and uh, I have no pain because uh, this is a cold fire. This cold fire is very uh, particular uh, and unexplained up to now. And uh, uh, this uh, was produced uh, by uh, some, uh, some facts uh, up to now unexplained that uh, uh, happened when the Orthodox Patriarch uh, went into the edicule of the sepulchre and there formed some uh, fires, uh, uh, some uh, manifestation uh, linked, I think, with the corona discharge. 
in that occasion I have uh, uh, the possibility to make uh, some uh, tests. Here uh, is uh, my 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 place where I had made some measurement. In particular, uh, I lighted two changes, two equal changes. One lighted with a holy fire, the other lighted with a, a common fire. I put a, 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 a cloth uh, similar to that of, of the shroud up, up uh, these two uh, channels, and this is uh, the result that I, I obtained. Here is uh, the, the sample, and the, the normal fire burned completely the, uh, the linen cloth, uh, as it should uh, have done, but uh, the holy fire only singed the, uh, the, the linen uh, without burning it, because uh, the holy fire was uh, hot, uh, not hot fire, but was composed by uh, cold plasma. And this could be just uh, the source of energy that could have uh, produced the, the body image. I have made some experiments in my University of Padua under the guide of Professor Pesavento uh, in the uh, where uh, we have the occasion to put uh, a mannequin uh, representing of, uh, the Jesus of the Shroud, covered by a cloth, and uh, subject to uh, a, corona, a corona discharge. Here is uh, the, the experiment uh, where bluish light was produced. And uh, we have had some results. Uh, this is the best one that uh, reproduces, I can say, all the characteristics, uh, the very pe peculiar characteristics of the shroud image at the microscopic level, but uh, at micro, uh, micro, uh, at uh, uh, at a higher level, uh, in, we see that the image uh, is uh, uh, this uh, at macro level. This uh, image is not uh, so beautiful as that of the shroud. So uh, a lot of work must uh, be done uh, uh, until to reach the very good results of the shroud. So this is uh, the, the point uh, at which uh, uh, the research on the body image has arrived up to now. But uh, uh, as I have uh, already uh, said, uh, I think that uh, the uh, elective discharge, uh, called the corona discharge, uh, is not uh, the only responsible of the body image. Probably uh, there was some other uh, facts that uh, uh, helped to produce the, Im the image that uh, I can call divine uh, photography because uh, it was a miracle uh, happened in the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, that involved many other uh, facts uh, linked to a, a, a photography uh, not, uh, not similar to uh, the photography that uh, we, we, we intend now uh, in this period. If you, if you want, I can, uh, I can um, uh, explain uh, at which point uh, uh, my research is uh, arrived uh, on this argument. Yeah, please, yeah, please continue uh, on the divine photography thing and what you found so far. Uh, do you want to uh, continue with the divine photography? Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, let me go uh, here to find. 
So uh, divine photography is a working hypothesis. I am working uh, for, uh, by some years, and uh, I think uh, to present uh, uh, some uh, initial uh, ideas uh, in uh, the new book uh, that I am uh, writing uh, with Bob Sifker uh, about uh, the comparison of the Holy Shroud and uh, uh, the Holy Fire. Uh, in this uh, uh, idea, I think uh, that uh, uh, many uh, factors uh, were involved in this, uh, and uh, uh, I have put in uh, evidence the, the normal, the common materials that are necessary for a photogra common photography. We need a sensitive material like the paper. Uh, a flash uh, to, uh, to uh, in, uh, impress the image on the sensitive material. We need a photographic reaction and uh, a proper development and fixation of the image on the support. In reference to the divine photography, I think that the body fluid of Jesus Christ, of the corpse of Jesus Christ, mixed with species, impregnated the holy shroud. The flesh was correlated to the flesh of energy linked to the resurrection for me. Uh, that contained also a uh, part of corona discharge, electric discharge, during the resurrection in the Holy Sepulchre that uh, reach, uh, react chemically with the body fluids, uh, produced amines in the linen fabrics of the Holy Shroud. Then uh, the sugars uh, perhaps co uh, contained in the species and other material of the holy shroud that wrapped uh, Jesus Christ, uh, impregnated uh, with fluids uh, produced uh, the chromophore CC in the Maillard reaction. And this was uh, the uh, photographic reaction that I think was uh, probably involved uh, the bo body image of the shroud. The development uh, consisted in time, times of uh, uh, weeks, uh, uh, months, or perhaps years, that uh, developed uh, the body image and uh, allowed to uh, the double C uh, carbon uh, bond, uh, to produce uh, the chromophore uh, that uh, is uh, responsible of the body image we see on the shroud. Awesome. Thank you very much for, for sharing that. So, yeah, I want to turn it straight over to Bob S. Uh, the, as the, the other proponent. Do you, do you want to give sort of your opening presentation uh, on your, your image forming mechanism and what you think happened? Well, I, th I think uh, what Julio's just gone through is uh, world changing. Uh, until I read Julio's uh, 2019 paper, I had never even heard of the miracle of the Holy Fire. Uh, I, am, I was brought up in a devout Catholic family, uh, uh, went to theology school after I retired, uh, in the software industry, uh, got a master's in theology. I had never heard, nor was it ever mentioned, the miracle of the holy fire in the Western church. And yet the Eastern church, it's central, central to their faith. Uh, it's an amazing read, and I've studied it since. Julio has opened a door that is, uh, uh, it's kind of scary, but it's, profoundly important. I don't know, Bob Rucker, have you ever heard of the Holy Fire until you read Bob or Julio's paper? No. Have you done any study on it since? No, not really. <laughs> uh, when you do, you'll find that it's uh, it's been around since day one. The resurrection of Christ and uh, the Holy Fire are linked together. 
Uh, I think Julio's on the right track here with all his analysis. Uh, one point that I, I have a question on uh, is the body apparently uh, was not unfolded from the shroud cloth. The shroud cloth, I, I do believe the cloth moved through the body image and created the, uh, but that's to be determined. I, <clears throat> I think Julio has opened a wonderful path of renewal for the shroud with the holy fire. I think the connection is absolutely sound. Dale, I don't know if you've done, have you read Julio's 2019 paper? Um, I have, and uh, I, but I just got it <laughs> today from, from Teddy. Uh, Julia knows Teddy. <laughs> well, um, so so yeah, I had never heard of it. I'm a, I'm a Protestant as well. Um, so I was I was looking into it. Um, I have some questions and stuff. I'm I'm a little bit skeptical of like the initial flame thing. I don't know how to explain the beard stuff. So I'll probably be asking you guys about about that uh, later on. But so yeah, I just found out about it yesterday. If that makes sense. Uh, it's it's a startling revelation. The shroud is uh, uh, is a miracle. The oh. miracle of the holy fire. When you link that up with the image on the shroud, yes, there's explanations to do. There's study to do. There's detailed scientific inquiry to be made. But uh, it's a profound linkage, and a Western church knows nothing about it. Again, if you go to Wikipedia, if you mention this to the average person, I think we have a cultural problem, Dale. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're linked into this so, so profoundly. How do you explain this to the larger, larger public? Uh, Bob, you're still questioning the, the holy fire. Uh, the evidence, you have to read a couple of, there aren't very many books on it, frankly, out there. Julio's new book will be one of uh, two other books, uh, but it's a profound linkage that's going to change the world. That's my opinion. Yeah, I, def I definitely think it's, it's it's piqued my interest. Just reading that 2019 paper is something that I want to look into deeper. So, I'd, yeah, I fully agree with what you're saying there. Dale, oh. there there are two there are two books, two authors, uh, Bishop. Uh, uh, an Orthodox bishop has written a book on the holy fire, Occientos, and another book has been written uh, on the shroud. I will get you the reference to those books. You ought to publish those, mm -hmm. you know, on your website, those references, and then uh, refer to Julio's emerging new book on the, on the same topic. Awesome. Awesome. I definitely will. All right, uh, all right, cool. So, Bob, all right, I can see you're waiting patiently. So, I know that you've got a slightly different idea of how the shroud images were formed. So, do you want to give your sort of opening take on, on that front? Uh, okay, uh, let me do a little bit of introduction here. Um, again, I, I think we're coming kind of to, together in, in some senses uh, on this. Um, I, I realize that there are unknown areas in physics. Um, and I, I would say the holy fire is, is one of them. You know, and from my perspective, in working on the Shroud of Turin, uh, I don't like mentioning miracles or the supernatural or the divine. Uh, I, I want to take my Christian believer's hat off and put on, put my scientific uh, researcher hat on uh, because uh, the vast majority of scientists and engineers, uh, mathematicians are always trained from the perspective of naturalism, that we simply, the only option uh, to use in any, any explanation is the laws of physics as we currently understand it. We're not allowed to simply appeal to miracles. Uh, that's how they're trained. So that uh, I'm, I'm afraid that when scientists or engineers or mathematicians hear shroud researchers use the word miracle and supernatural and divine, their tendency would be to simply trash it. 
and not even read further than that. And they would just assume that we're biased and therefore we're, uh, you know, we're, we're buying into this because of bias and not so that they wouldn't actually get to considering the scientific evidence. So in, in the way that I approach the whole subject is that I don't mention miracles, supernatural or the, or the divine. I merely say that what we're dealing with here is something that is uh, outside or beyond uh, our current understanding of the laws of physics and just leave it there. Uh, and then when you come to the realization based upon approaching the science of the shroud in that way, you come to the realization that, that uh, this shroud uh, did cover a crucified man, I believe that emitted a burst of radiation from his body to create the images. Uh, and you, when you search through all of the historical documentation that we have access to, there's only one man and one event that that can refer to, and that is Jesus and his resurrection. So that then once you come to that realization, then it's reasonable to start talking about miracles and supernatural and the divine. You see, so it's a little different approach. But uh, I, I think you're con I think we're consistent, though, Bob, because uh we're not bringing in the miracle or the divine from outside. We're bringing it from inside. Mm -hmm. uh, this phenomenon called the miracle, the holy fire, is a reality, mm -hmm. a scientific reality. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've done any reading on it. There's been lots of scientific studies on it. They're limited, but there are several including the work that Julio's been doing. And so we're not just appealing to a miracle out of clear space. We're, we're, we're historically and physically referring to a phenomenon that is unbelievable until you study it. Uh, the miracle of holy fire, you haven't heard of it. Dale hadn't heard of it. I hadn't heard of it. I don't know when Julio first heard of it, but when you dig into it, it's a, it's a phenomenon that goes back historically to the first century. And the, and the scientific measurements and the testimony and what's going on, it's a reality. It's not a miracle that is done and finished with, it's observable. It's a phenomenon that you can see, you can measure, and you can grasp, it happens. It's so startling. It changes the game. So it's not an appeal to, to, uh, uh, to a miracle for the, for the image. It's linking a known miracle that has not been known in the West for 2000 years, but now is starting to become known and studied. Linking those two together is the powerful thing. So take a look at this miracle of the holy fire and uh, but there aren't there aren't many sources, frankly, Julio. Uh, there are two sources, right? I mean, we've got the two books, uh, but but the phenomenon is recorded going back two thousand years. So we're not appealing to something that isn't established. It's just not established in the West. Yes. That's the reality. Yeah. So. All, all, I'm all I'm saying is that you don't need to use the word miracle, supernatural, or divine. You can simply use the phrase, we're in the holy fire, we're dealing with something that's outside or beyond our current understanding of the laws of physics. And you'd, you'd have a better reception amongst 95% uh, of scientists because they wouldn't simply reject it because of the words you use. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. And, uh... Yeah. What the, I'll, it's I'll a phenomenon that happens at one time in one place. It's a phenomenon that happens on Orthodox Holy Saturday, tomorrow, mm -hmm. uh, in the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, and even further within the burial tomb of Christ, the Edicule. That's the only place it appears. So, um, so this is great. Uh, and I'll leave it up to Bob R. If you, you want to save this, because I want to be fair to you to let you give your opening speech about your mechanism. But would you prefer to continue on or, or wait until after to, to engage on the holy fire thing? No. Uh, well, look, let me just engage a little bit further and then sure. I'll go into my mechanism, if that's sure. okay. Yeah, it, this is your time. So you're in, you're in control. You do what you want. So yeah. Yes. Um, I have long known about ball lightning. 
And that's a phenomenon that is really outside or beyond our current understanding of the laws of physics. It relates to uh, electrostatics. And so I would suspect that holy fire also relates to electrostatics. Uh, and it's very interesting as, as to the li limited location and timing uh, of the occurrence here. And I think you can make some powerful arguments uh, in, in that direction, but uh, we're basically dealing with electrostatics, uh, I would say, in, in this study. Now, uh, it, it's interesting here that in my, well, let me go in, into my mechanism. I'm, I provided to you my paper 32 uh, that I, I wrote to document my presentation in Baltimore last year to the American Association for Non-Destructive Testing. Uh, and and I, I approach this kind of from two different perspectives, I, I think are, is helpful. It's like a maze that you're trying to solve. And a difficult maze is easiest to solve if you start from both the starting point and the ending point, and, and then work the line into the maze and hopefully they match somewhere. So that's what I'm doing. So the starting point here it is to realize uh, why you can see the image of a crucified man on the shroud. That, that's, that's where I think you have to, that's the starting point for this. And then the ending point is what would cause discoloration of the fibers. So you kind of work from both ends of, of that problem. So what, why is it that we can, we, when we look at the Shroud of Turin, we see the image of a crucified man. Uh, and I like to make a comparison just with a photograph. If you look at a photograph of an individual, why is it that your brain uh, has a perception of the, uh, of the person's image, the, the person's appearance by looking at the photograph? Well, the answer, uh, if you do all the analysis of how we see and how the information is transferred from the person to the camera, to the photograph, to our eyes, to our brains, uh, that the answer is, is that uh, there's information encoded into the pattern of discolored fibers on the Shroud of Turin. The key is information. Uh, so that in, in Julio's uh, presentation here, he doesn't deal with information, but you have to get the information uh, to the cloth in order to control the di discoloration mechanism. It's an absolute requirement. Uh, if, if you don't get that information there that defines the appearance of a crucified man, all you will get on, on any medium is chaos. You have to get the information there to control the mechanism with, which e either discolors the pixels on a photograph or discolors uh, the fibers on the shroud. So then the information that defined the appearance of a crucified man was not inherent to the limestone. And you can tell that if you were an observer in the tomb, you looked at the limestone, you wouldn't see the, your brain wouldn't perceive the image of a crucified man. You'd only see that by looking at the man himself, because that's where the information is inherent to. So the information has to be communicated or transported or carried from the body to the cloth in some way in order to make a focused image. So that, that the way in which the information is carried has to be of a particular type. It can't be a random, uh, a random process, uh, uh, such, such as uh, diffusion of molecules uh, or such as uh, a, a, a flow, uh, a, a wave in a medium, such as sound waves, that both those spread out and would be very difficult to, to have focused information to form a fairly good focused image uh, on the cloth. And I don't think we need to go into the, uh, you know, what the resolution actually is. It's just that we can see the image of the, of the face uh, on the shroud and that, that's good enough. So, you, uh, so that my conclusion is that the very best way that you can communicate that information is by radiation because each photon or particle of radiation travels in a straight line in which it is emitted. Uh, uh, lasers would be an example of that with uh, photons or particle accelerator would be a, a, an example of that with particles. Now, I think that the, the image was formed primarily by charged 
particles. Uh, because when we approach it from the other direction uh, and ask the question, what discolored the fibers? I think that there's two answers. One is heat, electrically deposited heat, deposited in the extremely thin 0.2 micrometer uh, circumferential region around the outside of the fiber. Uh, and there's also a possibility that, that the discoloration could be formed by a chemical attack from the air uh, that is based upon, for example, ozone uh, that was produced by static or electrical or corona discharge uh, from the top fibers facing the body could form uh, both an electrical discharge to deposit heat only in that very thin region, or it could create ozone in the air to uh, discolor the images. Now, regarding the possibility of ozone, testing can be done to determine whether ozone attack on linen would create the coloration that we see, that is a light sepia or, or straw yellow coloration. If it doesn't, then that's ruled out. Uh, but I, I think the better example would be electrical heating uh, that deposits heat only in that very thin uh, 0.2 thick region uh, around the outside of the fiber. So what would do that? And that's the next question. So I, I find the evidence, then I ask questions. And then we go to the next level and I ask questions. So what would cause the heat to be deposited in that very thin a 0.2 micrometer region around the outside of the fiber. Well, it's an interesting fact that I, I learned at the University of Michigan in, in my first year of physics class that uh, an alternating current of electrons in a conductor, uh, an alternating current, it is the electron movement is only in the uh, outer circumferential region of the conductor. And the higher the frequency goes in the alternating current, the thinner that electron flow is on the circumference of the conductor. Now that's exactly what we're seeing uh, on the very thin discolored layer of the shroud. So, okay, uh, that's, that's the direction that my thinking goes. So then the next question is, well, what would cause an extremely high frequency alternating current uh, in the fibers? so that they could be discolored by uh, electrical heat deposition in that very thin region? Well, I, I think the rather obvious answer uh, is that this electron flow in the fibers is, is caused by a, a, a extremely rapid and intense burst of radiation uh, from the body. And that's what it takes to convey or carry or communicate the information to the shroud that's needed to form the image. Uh, but to, to form the very rapid alternating current in the fibers, that radiation burst has to be oscillating uh, between vertically up and vertically down. Now, that's the only option that I can think of. So, you know, I, I'm not just being, uh, you know, uh, coming at this from a weird or strange direction. I'm, I'm simply trying to answer the questions as to how the evidence could be produced. I'm doing uh, reverse engineering from the evidence to the cause. So that therefore, I, I think that, that the, the, both the front and the dorsal images were formed by a very rapid, uh, intense burst of charged particle radiation primarily. Now, I'm not ruling out electromagnetic radiation, but I think the images were formed by charged particle radiation uh, that, that were deposited on the cloth and thus communicating the information to the cloth that's needed to control the discoloration mechanism. And, and that control happens by creating uh, a, a very uh, rapid alternating current in the fibers, which deposits heat uh, uh, in that very thin uh, circumferential region around the fibers that creates the image. Um, it could also be due to uh, creation of uh, ozone uh, in the air immediately around the fibers. So that's my mechanism that I have uh, communicated in my paper number 32 in summary.
Awesome. All right, cool. So with that said, um, I, I want to kind of open it up to some Q and A's and that. So Bob S, I, I'm so sorry that I interrupted you guys. We're having a great convo. So, so let's get back into that. I'll start with you and let's look at the, the Holy Fire in general. So I just want to ask some quick clarification questions. Um, so my understanding from reading Fonte, Fonte's paper, and I wish I could ask him, but it's on the spot. So I, I'll ask you as well. I'll ask you as the representative here. So my understanding, there's three alleged miracles that take place. Number one, the lighting of the candle itself is supposedly miraculous. Then there's also the fact that within the first 20 minutes or so, it, it's not hot. It's a cold fire. And that's evidenced by people putting their hands in or Giulio Fonte has his, his beard and it's not getting burnt. Um, and he also did those tests. Um, and then the third one, um, my mind just went, oh, uh, like the wick. Uh, isn't getting used up or burnt or something for the first 20 minutes. Is that correct? Is that, do I have that correct in terms of the claims? Well, only in the sense of it being con uh, conjoined to a candle. We're not, we're not limiting holy fire to a candle. Okay. Julio's not doing that. He's saying the light itself is the issue. Uh, the holy fire is explained as holy fire and it's a candle and their candle doesn't burn and this and that. But the, the concept of God's holy fire is not just a candle. I mean, in, in the eticule, you see flashes, you see ball lightning, uh, you see candles lit spontaneously. There are phenomena that are going on that are simply not statistically consistent with a burning candle. It's way beyond that. Now, I'll go back, uh, working with John Jackson for so many years. Um, his, his hypothesis of image formation was called the fall-through hypothesis, that the body became, instead of becoming, uh, instead of being a physical body, at the moment of the resurrection, the body became light and transparent. It, 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 the cloth simply Trent collapsed through that radiant body and picked up the image. I think we have to go back and say now with the, with the phenomenon of the holy light, let's take another look at that. Uh, because it looks like the, cl the cloth collapsed through the body, picked up the image, and the body became transparent in light. Now, the holy fire that Fonte has uh, tested uh, was yes, it was confined to a cam candle. That's the only place you can you can today hold it and do experiments on it. Is uh, in the eticule you see these flashes of light, but the holy fire on the candle is is uh, a limited phenomenon. So but that that's a limited phenomenon. But if the body became transparent with holy light, whatever that might mean, and the cloth collapsed through that body and picked up the image. Now you've got a little bit different. And that was John Jackson's uh, mm -hmm. hypothesis before he even, he, he knows nothing about the holy light until Monty's work as well in the West. Gotcha. Just something unknown. So we're not talking about limited to a, a, a candle type light. We're talking about divine light. Gotcha. And, we, and it seems like a strange argument, but the holy fire, is divine light. When you study it, there's no other explanation. Gotcha. Perfect. So I think that that's a great point for the audience. So I'm glad. Thank you so much for, for clarifying that because, you know, the, the holy fire phenomenon itself, even if we pretend you're the, you know, taking the skeptic side, let's say we falsify that that's not a miracle. That still wouldn't mean that this some similar type phenomenon of divine light or divine fire created the shroud, the shroud images specifically. So, you know, falsifying one wouldn't necessarily falsify. Well, here's, here's the point I'm making. There's one place only that this phenomenon that Julio has measured and other scientists have measured takes place. It's on Holy Saturday, Orthodox Holy Saturday, in the burial tomb of Christ. There's a unique phenomenon that occurs there every year that is inexplicable scientifically that's not known in the west the eastern orthodox have had this knowledge for 
2,000 years. We've only had that knowledge since Julio did his work. It's not known in the West. Gotcha. All right, cool. Um, so, right. And once we, once we establish that something miraculous, something unexplainable scientifically is going on in the burial cloth of Christ, now you say, wait a minute. The body became light. The cloth claps through that light, picked up the image. It's a divine photograph. Gotcha. Remember that, that the cloth was found. It was, Jesus didn't extricate himself from the cloth at the point of the resurrection. He wasn't resurrection, resurrected and then had to fumble with the, with the cloth to get himself out of the cloth. He was out of the cloth. The cloth just collapsed. It was just laying there where it, where it had been wrapped around his body. It wasn't unwrapped. It was still wrapped when the, when, when the disciples went into the tomb. The cloth was laying there, but there was no body inside it. So Jesus didn't have to unwrap himself from the cloth. The cloth, the, the, the hypothesis that the cloth collapsed through the body space is a very valid hypothesis at this point gotcha okay and the second the last question follow-up question i want to ask you bob s um so with this method um how do you guys account for the blood stains um is that just through direct contact or do you guys have a, a mechanism in mind to explain the blood stains at all or no the, the body didn't take the blood stains away the blood stayed there Gotcha. So they got to the cloth through direct contact and then they stayed after that. Is that the, the blood? The blood is is uh, a, a, an, an issue that it, it was on the body that stayed on the cloth. OK, perfect. All right, cool. Uh, so, so, Julia, I just want to uh, turn to you. So um, OK, so with the Corona discharge, I know that you mentioned you don't accept this as a full explanation anymore type thing. Uh, do you know what were some of the reasons for that? Like what were the features that you don't think it can explain on its own? Is that, hopefully that's making sense. I have some difficulty understanding the question. Can you please write it? write it um okay so thank you no problem so it'll be in the chat my, my c button doesn't uh... there you go yes Good question. <laughs> uh, to answer uh, the question regarding the fact that uh, I have uh, not considered only uh, the corona discharge is perhaps this one. Uh, this uh, image, uh, as I have said uh, before, was uh, very similar uh, in the microscopic features of the body image. But uh, there are some problems in reproducing uh, the macroscopic features. And uh, uh, I thought uh, in, very, in various solutions, uh, but uh, I came to understand that uh, very probably the corona discharge was one of the effects that produced the body image, but not the only one. And uh, I tried to uh, analyze other uh, hypotheses. And uh, in particular, I reconsidered the hypothesis that uh, in the past I have uh, I criticized a lot that of uh, the famous uh, chemist Ray Rogers, 
who uh, was linked to the hypothesis of the corona uh, the, of the um, Maillard reaction. And uh, as I wrote here, you can see that uh, somewhere here, I have uh, reconsidered the Maillard reaction, not as proposed by Ray Rogers, who uh, thought uh, to the um, to, uh, uh, to the uh, decomposition of uh, the, the corpse that produces uh, reactive gases, but uh, and not uh, and the, the same Ray Rogers was not able to. Uh, to reproduce an image uh, with uh, the resolution uh, that we see in the uh, shroud and the other uh, characteristics uh, uh, that uh, um, the, the only uh, uh, chemical effect is not uh, able to reproduce. So I had uh, the idea, here is uh, my working hypothesis, to uh, combine uh, the effect uh, of the electric discharge or corona discharge to the chemical uh, facts uh, proposed for a scene by Ray Rogers. I think that uh, perhaps the uh, conjunction of uh, these two hypotheses could uh, lead to uh, a complete exp explanation of uh, why the body image was formed. This is only an initial hypothesis that uh, must be uh, studied, uh, studied in, in depth, uh, also with experiments. And uh, I have made uh, some uh, small experiments on uh, small uh, linen fabrics. And I, I saw that uh, we can obtain a uh, good, uh, quite good uh, uh, image if uh, we use just uh, some, uh, some body fluid mixed with species. In this case, uh, the, the effect of corona discharge are better impressed on this image. So I think that uh, the only uh, flash of energy or corona discharge is not sufficient to reach uh, the, uh, many characteristics, many features of the body image we see uh, on the shroud. All right, awesome. Um, and one other question I, I'd like to get your, your take on quickly there, Julio. Um, I've just, just posted it in the chat, uh, but it's for the audience. Um, there's a low energy proposal like by uh, Dan Spicer and E.T. Totten. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with their electric mechanism. And if so, would you like to give kind of your brief take on that? There are many possibilities, uh, and uh, uh, now uh, I am uh, uh, still uh, speaking of flash of energy, burst of energy, also because I was uh, very positively impressed by the hypothesis of John Jackson. But uh, uh, just uh, uh, looking what uh, happens uh, in the Holy Sepulchre, I was uh, uh, just thinking to uh, not only a burst of energy, but a more prolonged energy uh, production uh, that uh, could be the cause of uh, this uh, body image. Uh, this uh, uh, is uh, also in agreement uh, what I was able to see in the inner of the uh, edicule of the Holy Sepulcher through uh, Greek television who filmed the inner of uh, this sepulcher. 
In particular, I uh, looked, I saw uh, some flashes of blue energy, uh, uh, blue light, uh, similar to that uh, was uh, described, but uh, some patriarchs that uh, uh, described what happened in the Holy Sepulchre. And uh, I saw that uh, the, uh, this uh, um, burst of, of energy, this flash of energy, is not uh, uh, so short as uh, I was thinking, but uh, it lasted some fraction of seconds. And uh, uh, now I'm thinking if uh, the flash of energy uh, lasted from, uh, for uh, uh, nanoseconds, uh, as some scientists uh, suppose, or uh, lasted for a longer time uh, of the order of seconds. So uh, there is uh, a lot to, to think about uh, this phenomenon. Awesome. All right, perfect. Um, so yeah, turning to you, Bob Rucker, I'll just uh, ask a quick uh, question. So one thing that Bob S. was mentioning about is uh, there are some reasons to favor the cloth collapse notion. And I know that you go against that. So do you want to maybe um, address what are some of the reasons that you don't think that the cloth collapse works? Um, and that way you guys can go back and forth after. Uh, well, y yes. Um... My paper number 14 uh, on my website, shroudresearch.net, uh, is titled Potential Problems with a Cloth Collapse Hypothesis for Image Formation on the Shroud of Turin. Uh, and so that uh, is, is my thoughts on that issue. But um, there, I see a lot of problems with that, uh, that concept. Uh, for example, uh, Bob Seifker mentioned that the body uh, turns into light. Uh, well, um, that's the first time I've heard that. It, it's, you know, it's always been uh, tur turned into, a, I forget the term, maybe Bob knows the, the terminology that's used, but that the body turns into something that doesn't resist the, the fall through of, of the cloth. Now, if, if the body were to turn into light, I would assume that would be done by Einstein's equation E equals mc squared. So in my paper number two, uh, I then calculate how much energy would be released uh, by the, the weight of a 170 pound person uh, entirely being transferred into energy by Einstein's equation of E equals mc squared. And what I ended up with was an amount of energy equal to a thousand times the largest nuclear weapon ever uh, detonated uh, on the earth. Now, of course, that would destroy the shroud the tomb, Jerusalem, and probably most of Israel. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think it would be tenable to say that the energy in the body was transferred uh, just into light. Now, uh, uh, in Bob, I, I'm sorry, just to interrupt, I'm, I'm not saying that. Okay. Uh, you're, you're saying that the body was transferred into energy. No, yeah. I'm, I'm not saying that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, th that's, yeah, that, that's a common. Yeah. A common perception is that the body disappeared by the, the mass of the body being changed into energy, which, which then maybe it was photons, maybe it was uh, neutrinos, you know, whatever. Uh, but, but in my paper number two on my website, I go into all, all those considerations. Now, some, just some of the, the, the problems, I, as I see it, are, are multiple with that concept. And I think John Jackson realizes these problems um, and, and has tried to find some resolution to them. Uh, and, and that is, uh, for example, that we have a front image and a back image, but no side image. So that if the body disappears very rapidly, which is the usual uh, ex explanation, that the body disappears very rapidly and that the cloth then collapses due to gravity and air pressure difference, so that the gravity and air pr pressure difference bring the cloth down, uh, and gravity wouldn't bring the bottom cloth, cloth up, but air pressure difference would if the disappearance is rapid. But if the disappearance of the body is rapid, then the sides of the cloth come in as well, and uh, the sides of the cloth would enter 
uh, into the, the region from which the body had disappeared so that we should see si images of the sides of the body on the shroud, which is not the case. So that, so that therefore, uh, John Jackson has said, uh, when asked the question, he said, well, maybe the body collapse or disappearances took up to a day and a half to occur. Well, in that case, that's, that's, that's the other extreme. Uh, I heard him say that. That's the other extreme. So that in, in that case, the bottom cloth would not come up uh, and would not form an image by going into the volume previously occupied by the body. Uh, but the top cloth would come down uh, just due to gravity, because there would be essentially no air pressure difference if the disappearance of the body took place over a day and a half. So that neither a, fa neither a fast disappearance nor a slow disappearance works. Bob, that's, that's, one, that's just one objection. Okay, can, can I interject something? Obviously, uh, that same morning, Jesus appeared to his disciples. The body, the body wasn't destroyed into energy. The body became a resurrected body. I think what we're saying and what John Jackson says, it would be interesting now in light, I, I will use the word light, in light of the phenomenon of the holy fire, now being brought to bear by Giulio Fonti, uniquely by Giulio, in this moment, Go back and read John Jackson's fall through hypothesis. He just says the body became mechanically transparent. That's the term, yes. And full of light. Not that, the, not that the matter of the body was converted into energy and light, but the body became transparent mechanically to the cloth. The cloth claps through the body. Now the body image is very consistent with that. That it would it explains it would explain so much about the body image, but two hours later Jesus is appearing to the disciples. Obviously, it, what his body is a resurrected body. Now that's something that science can't deal with. That's something new. The, you can't deal with a resurrected body scientifically. It's beyond science. What we're talking about is that moment between a non-resurrected body and a resurrected body. And the only way to do that is to implore the work of a God, something miraculous is taking place in the tomb of Christ on that day, in that moment. It would, it would pay to go back and say, we're not dealing with science once the resurrection begins. We're dealing with something beyond science. The resurrection begins at some instant within the tomb of Christ. But, we, but it's inaccessible scientifically at that moment when that starts to happen. And what Julia is saying is that that's, at that moment, we get a divine photograph. That's uh, all yeah. he's saying. Yeah, the hypothesis of a fall, uh, cloth fall through uh, would produce certain phenomenon uh, on the Shroud of Turin. For example, uh, when the cloth uh, collapses into the volume previously occupied by the body, the, the front of the cloth would encounter uh, what, whatever, the uh, of radiation in that zone. The uh, outside of the cloth would also experience that radiation, but the inside of the cloth would also experience that radiation, so that the discoloration should go through the entire thickness of the cloth, which is contrary to the evidence. So I think the evidence contradicts the fall through hypothesis. Well, the, the fall through hypothesis uh, invokes a miracle. It does. I mean, it, 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 is, it is trying to be consistent with what we have, which, which is its shroud and its image. Uh, well, fact, well, yes, yes, you have fact, to. You yeah, have you have to invoke multiple miracles, and that's where it, it becomes overly complex. Uh, scientists, or, or, or alternatively, very simple, that we're talking about a divine photography, and we simply can't explain it scientifically. It either becomes ultimately complex to wrap science around the resurrection, or to step back from science and say, we've got proof today 
of the phenomena of the holy fire, which we can't explain fully scientifically. And we have the resurrection. It's beyond science at that moment. Yeah, There's a yeah. little bit of humility involved in this scientifically, obviously, Bob, is all I'm saying. Yes, I, what I'm saying here is that you're starting from the wrong starting point. And that's what I see as the basic problem to these disagreements on the, on the different uh, mechanisms for image formation. Uh, it, I, I think it not a good idea to start from a concept su such, such as uh, the disappearance of the body or start with equipment such as a laser or, or a plasma ball, where you should be starting in this analysis is from the evidence itself and then do reverse engineering from the evidence to the cause. And that's what I've well, done. The fall through hypothesis actually tries to do that. I mean, it, it's worth going and reading it again, I think. Uh, the, the image on the shroud is, is phenomenal, but it is consistent with Jackson's hypothesis, the way he explains it. Yeah, yes, and, well, I, I see that three uh, miracles would be uh, have to be assumed here. You'd have to have, assume the disappearance of the body. And as a Christian, uh, I believe that the, the evidence supports that. You'd also have to assume a mechanically transparent body. Uh, and then the third miracle would, would be that the inside and the outside of the cloth uh, had uh, image formation on them, but not the inside of the cloth. So one thing, um... I just want to bring in Julio here, just in case, because uh, I don't want him sitting on the sidelines the whole time. Ju Julio, did, do you have any questions for Bob Rucker or challenges to Bob Rucker's? Uh, I, I, I have thought uh, to a comment uh, about uh, this last discussion for what I have understood because I cannot understand all. But uh, I have uh, to uh, make uh, this, uh, this note. Uh, we know that uh, science is made by men. Man is limited. Therefore, science is limited. As such, we cannot pretend to explain all by science. Miracle exists, uh, can be proved, but uh, cannot be explained. On front of the body image of the shroud, we have a very important particular miracle. Therefore, we can try to explain something by science, but uh, I think that science will not uh, uh, arrive to explain all we see on the shroud. Therefore, uh, it is very interesting to uh, continue to deepen the study by, from a scientific point of view. But uh, I am quite sure that science will not uh, uh, explain all we see on the shroud because the shroud derives from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah, yes, and I agree with that. Uh, and the place in, in my concept of Im image formation that is beyond my understanding at this point is the source of the extremely brief, extremely rapid radiation burst from the body that re results uh, in the image on the shroud. Gotcha. All right, perfect. Um, so Bob asks, now I want to turn it to you. Um, like, what what's your take on Bob Rucker's theory? Do you see any potentially problematic elements or challenges you'd like to discuss about his theory there? Outside of cloth collapse. Who are you asking, Dale? Oh, sorry, uh, to you, Bob. As I was giving you kind of a chance to critique Rucker's Rucker's ideas or theories. Uh, I I I've studied Bob Rucker's work and it's phenomenally good up to that moment of the resurrection. Uh, the, the absence of side images, I don't believe is consistent with a burst of energy uh, because what you would get is you would get a, a you would just get a, a, a mass of, uh, you wouldn't get an image of the, of the quality and depth that we have in the shroud. The shroud has 3D, uh, 
aspects to it. You've seen that image. It's, it's, it is, it's like a photograph. I think what Julio has here, divine photograph. And something changed at that moment that the resurrection occurred. The, it wasn't just a burst of energy because then you'd have the cloth, you wouldn't have such a fine image on the cloth. You know, I think the, the fall through hypothesis of Jackson has, has issues. He didn't know about the holy fire, but he's saying, gosh, it, it looks like the cloth must have collapsed through the body. Uh, it, it, it took moments. The, the light was still there. It didn't happen instantaneously. The resurrected body was still a body, but it, 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 it emitted light in a certain way that gave us this image. That's all you can say. Uh, because the body's not gone. It's not the conversion of that body into energy. Uh, because 15 minutes later, that same body is talking to the, to the disciples, at least in the Gospels. And then he appears in, in the room. And he's talking to all the disciples. So the body is not converted into energy, end of story. There's something different going on. We're going from a, a, a known body a material body to a resurrected body. And there's nobody that can explain a resurrected body other than God himself. Gotcha. Yeah, Bob R, I see you want to reply to that. Uh, yes, my papers number one and two go, go into uh, that exact item. My conclusion uh, is that the body did not disappear by being changed into pure energy. It probably disappeared by a transition into an alternate dimensionality. Now that's just physics talk for what the layman would say uh, that the body went to heaven. So using physics ling lingo, that would be the body made a transition into an alternate dimensionality so that the body could then reappear in the upper room without going through the, the doors or the windows, it just, just reappear in that space by a, a re-transfer from that alternate dimensionality into our dimensionality, uh, where we just have, what we perceive is four dimensions, three of space and one of time. But uh, string theorists tell us that there must be uh, at least uh, 10 dimensions in order to explain uh, experiments in current physics. So I, th I think that a transfer into an alternate dimensionality is, uh, physically within the realm of possibility. The, the other thing is that when I'm talking about an extremely rapid, intense burst of radiation, I have always uh, denied that this radiation goes in all directions. I have always said this, that this radiation is vertically collimated, like, like a million lasers going off inside the body, each laser being uh, vertically directed so that the radiation burst goes vertically up and vertically down. Uh, and with my new ideas now, I believe it's very rapidly alternating between the two, which explains what, why this, there's such similarity between the upper image uh, and the lower image that was below the body, front and back images. Bob, I, I, would, I would only make a, uh, uh, the following uh, response to that. Once you invoke resurrection, we don't need to go there. And you're, you're invoking resurrection when you speak of alternate uh, dimensions. At the uh, yes. moment that we say yes. the resurrection occurs, and if the shroud in fact is evidence of multiple dimensionality or whatever, mm -hmm. We're really out on a on a long board in a rough sea. Why go there? Yeah. Let's just uh, let's just yeah. get to the moment of resurrection and say we've got the shroud as a sign of that resurrection and stop there. See that uh, I think there's there's a there's a a point that we can try to take science beyond the moment of res beginning of resurrection, and and I and I think that's isn't necessarily positive in the nature of the argument. It just, it'll, 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 it'll keep the argument alive for another 300 years as we try to deal with that. No, Julio is saying, 
we've got divine photography as a result of that moment of resurrection. The cloth collapses through, the body doesn't offer resistance. Here are things and, and not go where beyond that. Um, I, I, I think we're talking about another 150 years of debate. Uh, in, in response here, yes, my, my papers one and two uh, are written from a Christian believer's standpoint based on biblical evidence and uh, theological considerations. Uh, those are the only two papers that I've written along those lines. Uh, on all the other papers, I take my Christian believer's hat off and just deal with science. So what I'm saying is that this extremely brief, extremely intense burst of radiation uh, was extremely rapid. Uh, and, and that uh, probably from a Christian perspective, uh, you know, in that, let's say microsecond, in that microsecond, that's when, when the uh, resurrection occurred so that the mass of the body was making a transition to an alternate dimensionality. So that in that, microsecond, it releases vertically collimated burst of particle radiation to form the image of neutrons to shift the carbon date uh, and the momentum of those particles when transferred to the blood, thrust the blood off the body onto the cloth, thus explaining the three main mysteries of the shroud. And to explain three of the main mysteries of the shroud with one concept, is a powerful perspective uh, to, uh, to attract scientists to buy into it and, and explore uh, the shroud in further experiments. Now, um, Bob, uh, Bob asks, um, just out of curiosity, I'll switch gears in a moment and have Rucker come on the divine photography hypothesis. But before we get to that, uh, did you get a chance to look at the list of minimal relevant features that I sent to you guys or? But, uh, oh, sorry, Bob, Bob S., did you? I, I'm not sure I saw all that, Dale. Okay. okay, so no problem. So it's basically more or less what Giulio Fonti presented in terms of body image superficiality. Uh, there, the, it's a vertically mapped process, or there's three-dimensionality, um, body image uniformities, um, stuff like that, the negativity, all of that stuff. It, is there any of the Shroud's features, physical or chemical features, um, that either you or Julio think Bob Rucker's hypothesis can't explain or it's problematic to account for that, that you guys would like to go over? So I'll start with you, Bob S. Is there any feature that you think don't, doesn't fit well with his theory? No, I, I, I don't think so, because I think Bob's being very careful in going into, into those uh, statements. My, my real objection is not the science, that Bob is invoking. It's just that it can, it, it's going a little bit further than it needs to. Uh, I think, I think the, the miracle of the holy fire and its reality and its knowledge that we're starting, you know, a year and a half ago, I had never heard of it. It's a game changer. And I, and I think that is a game changer that uh, says we don't need to go beyond the tomb and that moment of resurrection and the, the fall through hypothesis, I think has new life. Uh, I think the concept of divine photography has new life. And I think we're, we're being a little bit uh, aggressive to try to say we can fully understand and explain the resurrection scientifically for the sake of sciences. I don't think, we're, I don't think our, our job is to convince scientists that don't wanna be convinced. Uh, uh, it could go on for it could go on for decades. The arguments back and forth. I think we have a solution. The, the the appearance of the holy fire, the work that Julio has done, uh, the experimentation he's done, is the start of a new ball game. That's my point. Awesome. All right. Cool. And Julio, um, I just want to ask you the same question. Um, is, is there any physical or is there any property of the shroud in, in terms of its features that you think Bob Rucker's theory can't explain or, or doesn't explain well 
that you want to get his take on? You want you want me to write it? No, uh, there are many features of the the shroud that are very peculiar. Uh, but uh, each of them can be reproduced uh, in a laboratory. Uh, the big difficulty is uh, to, uh, to reproduce all of them together. This is impossible up to now. Up to now. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the problem uh, that uh, traduces uh, in the uh, reverse engineering that uh, Bob Racker uh, mentioned before, uh, that is uh, very difficult to uh, reproduce all the, uh, the peculiar feature of the body image together. To do so, uh, I think uh, it is necessary to uh, hypothesize some source of energies, some uh, environmental factors, some uh, substances that can uh, be used to reproduce this. Uh, in fact, uh, with the corona discharge, I was able to reproduce many of the uh, peculiar features of the shroud, but not all. And this is the reason uh, why I am changing my uh, point of view and I am re reconsidering other hypotheses uh, to, uh, to be recombined with uh, that of coronal discharge. So uh, I think that uh, the, the very uh, interesting uh, feature of the image of the shroud is that, uh, that it shows many, many, many peculiar uh, characteristics that are typical of miracles. I am uh, studying uh, uh, in parallel to the shroud other miracles uh, like uh, blood weeping uh, and so on. And I saw that uh, in, a, in every case, uh, there is a, a peculiar uh, feature, one or, or two or, or three peculiar feature that uh, demonstrate that uh, uh, this result comes not from man, but uh, from uh, an entity uh, more uh, uh, capable of us. And uh, this is uh, the uh, signature, if we want to say, the signature of God. God, uh, science is a, a result with something that uh, it is impossible to be reproduced by man. Awesome. All right, cool. Um, so, so, yeah, I think. What I'm hearing from you guys, it's it's mostly the methodology. For for you guys, you think it's more like it's co more complicated than it needs to be. This is a supernatural act. Um, all right. Um, well, Bob, I'll let you. Oh. Just a just a comment in response to that, Dale. Uh, sure. There's a new factor being played out here, and that is the phenomenon of the holy fire that occurs in the burial cloth. A burial tomb of Jesus today. That's a new factor. When you factor that in to the shroud also being present only in one place at one time at the resurrection of Jesus in the if if it's authentic, that new factor is a ball game changer. Now you don't now all of a sudden for the common man, uh, not only does the holy fire invoke the action of a divine reality but so does the shroud and you put those things together and you say well how come we have the shroud well we have the shroud because jesus promised us a sign it's a sign it was promised and the holy fire now changes that and i and i just uh, I just want to make that clear I, we haven't heard about it yet. we're just getting started on, on trying to understand it and uh, Julio's working very diligently to get 
a book out on that topic, but it's not known. Uh, the number of people in the Western world that know about it are, are on our hands. It's not known. Yeah, yeah. like I said, I was- and It's I, a game changer for not only uh, what happened uh, 2000 years ago in the tomb of Christ, it's, it's, a, it's a factor change for the shroud itself. And then we have to figure out how that comes together. So Bob Rucker, all I'm suggesting to you is go study that uh, holy fire phenomenon a little bit. And you'll say, gosh, if I, if I can bring that in, I don't need to, to squeeze science into the resurrection and the shroud as deeply. I've got a miracle. All right, awesome, well said, all right, perfect. So I wanna switch gear, oh, um, okay, yeah. So you can respond to it, uh, try to take like three minutes, but I wanna switch gears where you kind of address issues with their theory before we close out. So, so yeah, respond to, to that if you like, Bob. Right. Uh, yes, I, uh, I derived my uh, concept of image formation from uh, the data so that my concept uh, explains why uh, only the top fibers facing the body were discolored. It, it explains the color that was produced. It explains why uh, only uh, the 0.2 micrometer region around the fiber, all the way around the fiber was discolored. It explains uh, why the image is a, basically a negative image. Uh, it explains the three-dimensional information uh, on the shroud. It, it explains the uh, modeled appearance of the discolored fibers on the cloth. Uh, as far as uh, I, I have tried to uh, explain all of the evidences, and that's what my claim is, that this concept will explain all of the evidences on the shroud. If you can think of any evidences that this does not explain, please let me know. I didn't hear any. No, that, that's okay, Bob. Uh, publish those and, and let, let, it, let it be, be there. That's, that's important. Your work is very valuable in that regard. Mm -hmm. but, it, but it's irrelevant in some respects to push it too hard other, because we, we're bringing together the science and the reality and at the moment we've got the holy fire in the tomb of Christ, there's a, there's a disconnect. Uh, yeah. Or do we keep going? Yes, yeah. yeah. so the, the holy fire, I think, is an important item to investigate. Uh, we, we need to understand what, what's causing the holy fire. We need to understand what causes ball lightning. There's a lot of things about electrostatics we don't understand. Oh. Uh, While you're doing that, I'm going to go to church and pray. Because once, once you're convinced that this phenomenon exists and you've got enough science to say, yes, there's something inexplicable, this is the work of a divine being, science is irrelevant in the question at that point. Well, the biggest point now is to, is to marry the shroud to the, that divine photography. Uh, well, yes, if, if we knew that, that this was related, but it has to be determined whether it is or not. Now, what, what I see is that all different sides on this issue are kind of working toward the same conclusion. So that the holy fire is related to uh, uh, electrostatics. Uh, and that's my theory is my concept of image formation is related to electrostatics as well. Be because what I'm saying is, is that this burst uh, of vertically collimated radiation from the body created a, a static discharge or electrical discharge or corona discharge, very, various terms from, from the top fibers facing the body. So that uh, if the holy fire was related to that in some way, uh, I'm not opposed to that. Now, uh, Bob Brook, I, I, I do wanna give you a chance to kind of, I know it's just a working hypothesis on this divine photography aspect, but do you think that um, there are any features of the shroud or properties of the shroud that this hypothesis, as they've outlined, it can't explain or it's problematic that you'd like to get their take on and discuss with them? Well, I, I would just, the, I think the general conclusion here is that it's too early to claim that, that uh, this process can actually form any of the particular features that we see on the cloth. 
Uh, and I, I think there just needs to be further development of it. Well, wait a minute, Bob. I think, I think the, the fall through hypothesis uh, of John Jackson all of a sudden is more relevant. Uh, we've got a source of light. We've got something that happens. See, for the average person, uh, when you link the holy fire, now the, the, the question remains, <laughs> can we really still put together a communication channel to the masses of people about the miracle of the holy fire in the, in the edicule in Jerusalem? And that's what Julio is working on. Because in the Western world, it's unknown. But if it becomes known, all of a sudden now the, the relevancy of the shroud image being simultaneously with that. And we can, but for most people, they'll say, that's enough. I've got a fall through hypothesis. I've got Bob Rector's work. It's a combination of these things. It all makes sense. We have got a sign from God in the shroud and in the holy fire that link up in a phenomenal way. And they do. Yes, but but I, I'm I'm not convinced that the holy fire has anything to do with image formation. It, I'm sorry. It, it I'm doesn't. Sorry. It doesn't. It, it and it doesn't need to. It's a phenomenon that acts in a special way in the in the edicule of Christ on the eve of the resurrection. God's not limited to the holy fire. No. Oh, okay. Then uh, I, I thought. Well, I, I, I thought this was an effort to try and come up with a concept that explained the images on the shroud, but well, now I hear you saying that's this. my point. Go back and read the fall through hypothesis because I think Jackson was reaching at that point when he wrote that. But if he if he rewrote it with the holy with it, it just says God is acting, and we can't force God into a cubby hole. We've got to say, wait a minute, these things come together. I've got both the holy fire and the shroud in the same place at the same time. Enough for me. I am being given a sign. That's, that's, what, that's what is developing potentially from this linkage of the shroud to the holy fire. It, yes, but what, what I'm doing is that I'm taking a look at the specifics, uh, scientific evidence on the shroud and following it uh, to, to indicate to me what the, how it was caused. And I think that's the right way to do it. Start well, with okay. the evidence and follow it. Okay. Uh, uh, nobody disagrees with that effort. You're doing good scientific work. The, the problem is you've got 50 years of uh, work ahead of you. Well, for most people, it's simpler than that. God doesn't create signs that have to be fully explained scientifically. There is such a thing as inexplicable action of God, divine photography, it's labeled. So, so Bob, Barr, just to make sure my audience understands and make sure I'm understanding, your kind of main thing is, so, so number one, with the corona discharge proper hypothesis, uh, all agree, we, we can scientifically falsify that this alone explains all of the image, all of the shroud's image features. With divine photography, I hear you kind of saying, well, it's, it's too early. We, we don't know what features exactly it can or can't explain until we test it or, or something like that. Is, is that what your crit main criticism is? or what well, 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 yes. And, you know, what, what I hear being said here is, is that this occurs in one location one day out of the year. Uh, and, and yet on that day that it occurs, there's no resurrection taking place. So I'm not sure that this, this holy fire is related to resurrection, although maybe it's, it's the result of the resurrection, but it may, may not be the, a, a cause uh, of the re resurrection or a, of the image itself. It's not a cause of the resurrection. God is a cause of the resurrection and God is a cause of the holy fire. And they link up in a way that average person could say, enough for me. Yeah, I, I, I guess and, our, and, our culture- and At that point, science, your work can, can, can link into this, Bob. Take your work, uh, bring the holy fire into it, sum it up in the next two years, and you're on board. Uh, yes, it has to be much more specific for me to do that. 
there needs to be a lot more research here on exactly what the holy fire does and, and what it what it can cause uh, to it determine can cause whatever it, it isn't it isn't it isn't necessarily related to the shroud image at all other than God's divine light. Okay, well, no, see, now I'm hearing something. Now, see, see, what you're saying is the holy fire, Julio took the holy fire and exposed linen to it. And it, and it shows an image remarkably like the shroud image, it's superficiality. Okay, it has- but to, it has say, but to say, now, wait a minute, then God can only use the holy fire at the moment of resurrection the body itself can't, there's no, there's no variable. It has to be the holy fire that creates the whole image. That, nobody's saying that. We're saying we've got God's action. We've got it in the edicule every year. We've got holy fire. End of story. We've got a, a miraculous image called the shroud. And we've got God's miraculous action in the edicule every year. End of story. That's, that's, all, that's all we're saying. We can take science, like Julio said, there are some things beyond science. And, we're, and we're, we're, if we can get the holy fire linked to the, to the tomb and linked to the shroud in even simple ways that people can understand, that may be as far as we can go. Okay, so, so now I kind of hear you saying that, that the holy fire uh, is is not or maybe may not be related in any way uh, to the creation of the image on the shroud. Correct. The, okay. the holy, it, it's consistent with the image, but it's not related to the image. The holy fire is a simple phenomenon. Okay. So it's the action of God. The shroud is the action of God. That's why I say the fall through hypothesis is worthy of another read and to take that. And your work is worthy of another read, but but bring the holy fire into it, and you'll find that you can sum up your argument probably within 18 months. Okay, so, so say, uh, gonna, you don't need alternate dimensions. I don't need all this. All I need to say is I've got God's action. I've got divine photography. Okay, so and for the, for the average person, that's a sign from God. Okay, so I'll just kind of summarize what I'm hearing as a layman, I'm not a scientist like you guys, uh, but okay, so here's what I'm hearing. So, so with Bob Rucker's theory, his vertically collimated radiation burst or pulse, um, he, you have this initial supernatural event that God does his, his stuff. And then he think he's saying that he can account for all of the image features through physically consistent known processes or that sort of thing. Um, on your guys' end, your guys, so it's not so much about holy fire at all. That's that's just an instance that we use to establish the plausibility of the concept of divine light being used to create the images. So it's divine light kind of thing uh, at the moment of the resurrection. Um, so let's grant that. Then we ask the secondary question, okay, granted God used divine light, can that account for all the image features either through physically known uh, physically known processes and that sort of thing in the same way that Bob Rucker claims for his theory. And on that, the, it's an, I don't, I don't know, or what well, guy can use supernatural means even at that level. Um, have I characterized that right? Or have I butchered it? Um, what do you guys think? Of, was that a good characterization? Well, we're talking really about the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. We're not going to get an, we're not going to get a, scientific explanation for that. What we're really looking for is do we have material signs that are appearing in our hands that say we are seeing the action of God in the tomb of Christ every Orthodox Holy Saturday in the form of divine light? Mm -hmm. And it looks like the answer to that is a definitive, yes, we do. What else do we have in the tomb of Christ? One time only, we have the Shroud of Turin. Those link up in a way that says, maybe we need a little humil humil humility in our science beyond that point to say they link up. And for the average person, if you can make that argument sound enough, 
that's a life-changing argument right there. That's, that's the point, I think, that is being made. Okay. All right, cool. And Bob Rucker, what do you make of that characterization? Do you think that was kind of a good characterization of where the theories stand and the differences? So both have an initial God-designed event kind of thing, but then you're saying your theory is physically consistent after that. Um, yeah, so, 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 yeah, so let, let's say that the resurrection took place in a microsecond. Okay. So, uh, uh, and so that would be the miracle from a Christian perspective. The duration of that microsecond would be the miracle in which uh, Jesus was resurrected. Uh, and so what I'm all I'm saying is that in that microsecond, there were uh, uh, of the disappearance uh, of the body of Jesus from within the burial shroud, that there was a, a vertically collimated burst of radiation that, as indicated by the evidence on the shroud. And once you realize that, that uh, all of the subsequent events to that initial microsecond of the resurrection uh, can be followed with our current understanding of the laws of physics. Okay, so that's that, good. That's yeah, so, good. That, so that there are no miracles following that initial microsecond of the resurrection. Gotcha. All right, cool. Um, perfect. So at this point, I think um, I'll wrap up unless, do, do any of my guests feel that there's something I missed or we missed that we should discuss before we close out or you guys all happy? I think we're all happy and, and uh, I admire the work of, of Bob Rucker and I think he's on the right path. The problem is you can get into 20 years of arguments about multiple dimensions and all of this. I, I would hope that we can put this together for the, for the world in the next five years and have and say, people, pay attention. God has given us a sign and you can't back out of seeing that sign. We're very, with bringing the holy fire into this discussion about the shroud puts us in that kind of a time frame. The world, and, and is, is it us that are changing the world or is this in God's time frame that he wants to make sure that the world sees this, this sign? The holy fire and the shroud link up in a remarkable way that within five years, God is giving us a sign that could change the world. All right, awesome. So, so Bob, your work is fine. It's not a criticism of your work. It's just that your work could go on for 20 years if you get into multiple dimensions and stuff. And we just have to say, wait a minute. God is acting here. Yeah, that's what that's what the divine photography that the, those two words don't explain divine photography. It just says that's what's going on. All right. Awesome. And Bob, your your mechanical explanation and physical explanation may be right on. All right. Put it All together, right. but bring in the fact that in in back of that is not. It's not a non-miracle. You've got, you've got a miracle to work with here with the divine light. The holy fire is a miracle. All right, awesome. Uh, cool, so if, since everyone's happy, uh, I think that everyone's represented their positions well. So I'm just gonna let you guys each give uh, a closing, closing speech if you want. Um, so Julio, I'll start with you because I know you've been sitting there all by. Um, do you want to give a closing line or speech or comment? Um. Yes, uh, I can say uh, that uh, uh, the shroud is a, a very interesting uh, object to be studied from a scientific point of view, but uh, science uh, will not be able uh, to uh, explain what uh, we can see. To try to uh, better understand uh, what is codified in that uh, image, we can uh, enlarge uh, our view, and, uh, and it is uh, the, the job I am following now, 
is uh, to compare uh, what uh, it is uh, written in the Bible, in particular in the uh, Gospels, uh, with uh, what uh, we see on the shroud. And uh, uh, accounting for uh, the facts uh, related to some miracles uh, like uh, the Holy Fire, perhaps uh, we'll be able to better understand uh, what uh, it is there codified. But uh, uh, as I have said uh, before, uh, men uh, will be not able to understand all who uh, belongs to God. God's, uh, God, uh, in particular Jesus Christ and uh, the Holy Spirit, will blow on us and uh, will uh, help us to, uh, de to detect and uh, clarify some points uh, in order to uh, go further on the research on the shroud. In any case, I know for sure that the shroud wrapped the body of Christ, the resurrected Jesus Christ. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Um, Bob, Bob S. Um, I'll go. I know you kind of already gave a bit of a speech, but do you want to do you want to leave a closing word and, and add on to that at all? Or? Well, I, I think I think Julio just did that. Gotcha. Uh, uh, so you're happy when, when Julio has in, is introduced a new factor through discovery and but it's but it's not a new factor it's been around for 2000 years this uh what's called the miracle of the holy fire in the tomb of christ it's not known in the west julio has brought it to the west but everything else he said i i uh, i think sums up very very well and, and at the same time i i think bob rucker's work is all very valid i just think it needs now to find a home within this, this linkage with the Holy Fire. Awesome. All right, and Bob R, yeah, do you want to give your kind of closing speech or comments, whatever you want to say? I, I'm not sure that I need to say anything else. I think everything that's been important has been discussed already. Awesome, all right, cool. Uh, so yeah, with that, uh, I will wrap up the show. I hope that uh, all the guests enjoyed themselves. I hope that the the audience enjoyed themselves and feel that they got to represent their their ideas and the the evidence of the shroud properly and that sort of thing. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, despite our differences, um, look, we're all Christians and we all believe the shroud is great evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. So um, I think that that's that's a main thing that um, we all agree on and we should like that. Um, yeah, Bob Rucker, um, I'll probably I know this was your idea, so I'm hoping to do a part two if. Hopefully we can get John Jackson and Mark Antinacci. They, they might be interested to come on and discuss their image forming mechanisms and have kind of a informal dialogue as we did here for part two. So yeah, with that said, I thank everybody and have a great week.